uh, digital history seminar uh, sharing digitally at the Center for Urban History uh, of East Central Europe in Lviv, Ukraine. The event that is supported by the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And we are going uh, to talk today about uh, sharing digitally as it is mentioned in the title uh, digital history seminars at the center is basically in general digital uh, humanities uh, is one of the main focus of the our institution of the center for urban history we deal uh, uh, with the as it is mentioned in the in the name of our institution with the mostly in the field of uh, urban history but we consider it as a quite interdisciplinary thing and we try to combine it with other perspectives from other disciplines and we uh, very often also combine our research and uh, different initiatives and projects so, uh, along with public history projects and digital history projects so digital history is an important part of our institution but we not only try to uh, practice digital history but also to reflect on it as much as we can and uh, uh, the seminar today is one of uh, of the events in the series of uh, such seminars that we do uh, we try to do on a regular basis since 2018 called digital history seminars and this time um, uh, we wanted to explore in our discussions about methodological, ethical, uh, theoretical aspects of uh, um, digital or bo digital born or digitized historical sources, we want to explore the notion of sharing, uh, how um, humanities as a field uh, and different initiatives in humanities uh, cope, deal with the digital technology in their practices of sharing knowledge, sharing discussions, sharing informations, materials, uh, sharing methodology, and so on. And the overview of, uh, of these different initiatives uh, is one of the aims uh, of our seminar today, uh, because uh, any digital project is basically collective endeavor. It is very difficult or even almost impossible to do any digital a history digital humanities project uh, alone by uh, by yourself so uh cooperation collaboration exchange sharing is very important uh, in our perspective is very important uh, um, aspect of uh, such projects at least for our institution and for projects that we do we we try to to be in this discussion and in this exchange as much as possible and this is why it is also important for us to do this event uh, uh, in, in this discussion about uh, digital um, research infrastructures, tools and methods uh, here based, uh, at least institutionally based in V physically, it is not based in V, of course, it is widespread broadly uh, to geographically really broad audience. Uh, but we want to put this discussion also in local context. We want to invite Ukrainian audience for uh, for this event. We want to uh, to bring this uh, perspective of Lviv, Ukraine, Eastern Europe into this discussion. We think it is also really much. Um, it is also really important to uh, to bring this contribution to the general discussion about digital humanities from uh, from this region, from this context. Uh, today we are going to have uh, three sections, uh, three uh, parts of our seminar uh, about uh, quite different initiatives on different levels, but all of them I really, uh, I'm really happy that uh, we, uh, we have a chance to hear them today. We have, uh, we have a quite interesting program with different uh, initiatives about research infrastructures, uh, publishing platforms, uh, different kind of uh, collaborate, collaborating tools, publishing platforms online, uh, on journals, and so on. It is, uh, it is quite encouraging to have this different perspective today. And uh, we also have uh, um, audience of uh, registered uh, participants uh, who will be uh, listening this uh, this uh, presentations and asking their questions uh, via Zoom or uh, YouTube translation. It is quite broad. We um, honestly we were a bit surprised because initially we uh, started uh, promoting this event uh, specifically. 
but maybe not specifically, but mainly for the Ukrainian audience, we were very much interested to uh, invite people from Ukrainian universities, libraries, archives uh, to join our discussion today. And roughly half of all the registered participants are uh, from Ukraine. But we, at the same time, we received a lot of responses and um, um, uh, and the registrations from uh, quite geographically quite broad audience because uh, basically it's uh, most of the continents, all of the continents, uh, yeah, um, uh, we have uh, present uh, in at least in the list of registered participants. And we can also see that uh, disciplinary wise, it is also uh, various, uh, very, very different audience. We have, uh, uh, of course, from the digital humanities, from digital history, social sciences, but we also have uh, from very interdisciplinary uh, fields uh, uh, participants here today. So uh, I think it will be interesting experience for all of us to listen to different, those different perspectives, to hear questions, to hear discussion from these different perspectives. And uh, I really, uh, I really hope that we will have this discussion today. Uh, after each present section, at the end of each section, after th three presentations, we have a, a time slot specifically for asking questions and having this discussion. So I encourage you to leave your comments and questions in the chat uh, here in Zoom conference or uh, in, in YouTube uh, translation. And uh, yeah, I, just before I will uh, go to the first section, I also would like to say uh, thank you to the um, uh, colleagues at the center for the organizing and helping with the organiz organizing this event, uh, to Mariana Mazurak, Victoria Panas, who are here with me today in uh, um, uh, all logistics and administration of this uh, of this event, Alexander Dmitry, Irina Paslas, uh, Bogdan Shomilovich and Alexei Chebutaryov, who will be helping me with moderating uh, sections today at the seminar. And in general, all the colleagues at the center and beyond who took uh, part in conceptual and organizational development of this event. So thank you. And uh, uh, probably this is the moment, uh, if I'm not, for, if I didn't forget anything, probably this is the moment to pass the word to a uh, moderator of the first section, who is Bogdan Shumilovich, my colleague at the center and coordinator of public history programs of the center. He will introduce uh, speakers of our first uh, section, our first panel, and we will go uh, through the program forward. So I wish you uh, inspiring and interesting uh, seminar today. Thank you. Thank you, Taras. Uh, I have the pleasure to facilitate this early morning uh, session. And the title of the session is Research Infrastructures and Communication. We have three participants in this session. I'll name them, I'll name them but then I'll present each of the participants later uh, in the sequence. Okay. So the first participant is Erzebet Todd Cifra. Then the second, Pierre Munier, and the third, Frederic Claver. And we start from Erzebet Todd Cifra from a Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and Humanities. Erzebet works as the Open Science Officer at this organization, where she is responsible for fostering and implementing policies and practices related to the open dissemination of research results in the humanities. Her advocacy activities include providing workshops, webinars, and other trainings activities on a regular basis. She's also involved in European infrastructure building projects such as Open Air, Advance, Opera, SP, and Triple. She received her PhD in cultural linguistic in 2017 and also has a background in scholarly communication. The title of Erzabeth's talk is An Open Science Voice for the Humanities, a Humanities Voice for Open Science. Please, Erzabeth, you have 20 minutes. Uh, good morning, everyone, and Dobrohu Ranku. Thanks a lot for this uh, nice introduction. I'm going to share my screen with you in a minute. Uh, I hope you can uh, see it. And please uh, feel free to, you know, uh, discipline me time-wise. So once again, uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, 
Uh, I'm coming from your Western neighboring country, from Hungary, from a lesser resourced library, so to say. Um, so I think this is part of the reason why open science, open access uh, are really dear to me. And so, um, you know, like uh, open access to, to, to publications uh, always made sense to me because of this, but it also became very clear later that uh, having open access to traditional research outputs like uh, books or research papers will not fully solve our problem. So I want you to start with a small reflection, you know, and to stop for a second and think about your research. So think about your research in a broad sense, all the materials, uh, all the tools you are working with, all the outcomes, possible outcomes of your research. Um, can you place all of them on the bookshelf? Maybe not really, not all of them. So I think it's pretty clear that we no longer produce only papers, right? So research outputs now encompass a far uh, greater diversity than uh, publications in a strict sense. And we see many contributions above and beyond articles. So the question It seems like we have some troubles with the connection with Ershabat. Ershabat, do you hear us? Uh, we tried to do the testing yesterday in order to check the connection availability and everything, and it worked fine yesterday. I'm not sure what happened today, uh, but uh, you can st still see the screen by Ershabat, but not her. Okay, she, we lost connection with the Shabbat. Probably she will join us uh, in a second and we will continue. Okay, so Shabbat, can you hear us? We have lost the connection. Yes, sorry. Uh, I have a terrible connection today. Uh, we have a big storm here in Berlin and uh, that oh. also is a little bit of a trouble with my internet connection, I hope. Um, I won't have further problems with that. That's my bad presenting karma, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is very lost. Uh, so it seems that researcher requirements in the 21st century are no longer fully covered by archives, not even by the digital ones. So as production moves from shelves to computer racks, um, digital cultural institutions are being increasingly challenged um, to increase their capacity to maintain all the kinds of scholarship that we are producing digitally. Another problem is that um, the knowledge we create around this novel digital scholarly objects is happening in certain local contexts, in language contexts, um, in different knowledge silos. So uh, the second big challenge is how to connect them and uh, it's important because, among others, we can avoid doing the same work twice if we do that. Um, so this is pretty much where research infrastructures uh, like Daria come to the picture. And this is we need, why we need infrastructure of thinking also in the humanities. So luckily, uh, around the uh, uh, 2010s, research institutions actually recognized this need to make collective investments into knowledge creation and, and preservation services um, and invest into infrastructure that individual institutions could not um, um, maintain alone. So luckily at the same time, the European Commission also recognized this need for um, long-term planning and infrastructure investment. And they gave rise to what we call ERICS, European Research Infrastructure Consortium, which is a special legal framework that enables European countries to invest together into research support and support organizations 
um, for certain disciplines. So in 2014, Daria officially became one of these ERICs. And you know, the rest is history. Uh, luckily, we are not alone in this space. So we have a CLARIM, a sister infrastructure for linguistics, who became an ERIC pretty much at the same time. And we also have OPERAS, a research infrastructure for open scholarly communication in the social sciences and humanities. I think uh, my colleague Pierre Mounier will uh, tell you more about this in the next talk. But back to Daria. So Daria has now 20 member countries and one observer country, Switzerland, and a handful of cooperating partners. My country, Hungary, uh, is also among them. And so this way we connect several hundreds of researchers um, and the dozens of research facilities and tools and services across Europe. So what do we do? Um, we have four main uh, areas of activities. Um, we make resources and tools and methods that are important for humanists um, available in a form of an open marketplace. This is work in progress. Stay tuned because my colleagues Lo and Edward are going to uh, uh, talk about this in the afternoon. Uh, second, training is also super important and open access to training. So we try to equip researchers at all career stages with the skills that they need to excel in a digital and open research environment. We also collect, connect scholars with similar research interests. And we are also involved in policy making to give a strong voice to arts and humanities um, in conversations about the future of research, future of research funding, and the future of open science. So in the rest of my talk, um, I gonna just give you a couple of pointers and connect you with uh, services, resources, but also communities that or who might make your life a little bit easier as an arts and humanities scholar. So first of all, um, tools and services, here is a little bit of a sneak peek of what we have. Um, we have um, data repositories like uh, the German Daria DE or the French NACALA. All of them are specifically catering humanities data needs. We have uh, research analysis and standardization tools like vocabs, which is a collection of um, controlled vocabularies and ontologies from around humanities and something that we call the standardization survival kit for standardizing workflows. Um, we have training platforms like Daria Campus um, is um, a training discovery platform of ours. But if you would like to, if you rather um, want to um, browse for uh, digital humanities courses, physical courses at universities, um, in Europe, then you can also do that through the Digital Humanities Course Registry. Uh, I recommend you to visit our website and um, like um, take a look. Um, the big question is how to showcase all these um, items in our uh, treasury box the best possible way. And here again, uh, Lou and Edward are going to talk about this a little bit later. Also, how we connect them with the rest of European uh, research services. Um, there is also a social layer of this infrastructure. It's not only hardcore infrastructure, right? So uh, to this end, we have uh, the Daria working groups who are self-organizing transnational research communities based on shared research interests. So they connect knowledge around certain topics, certain knowledge areas across Europe, certain digital objects. Um, and many of them also develop and curate uh, research tools and educational materials. So here you can see some of them. Um, but if you visit uh, here again the website, you can browse through the whole collection of working groups. And the good news is that they are open to everyone. Uh, so if you can find something interesting, then you are welcome to join um, the community of peoples, people across Europe. Um, one of the youngest working group that we have uh, that uh, started in 2020 is dedicated to uh, research data management. 
Here you can see some of our members and you will recognize at least one familiar face uh, who is Taras, with whom we got to know each other through this uh, working group. Um, because we saw that research data management is becoming more and more important for our research uh, and also in research funding. So, but the generic discipline agnostic research data management guidelines do not always align well with the epistemological complexity of humanities workflows. I think uh, you may know what I mean. So we decided to launch this group. Uh, it brings together data professionals, culture heritage professionals, because we also know that uh, they have a super important role in supporting humanities workflows. And most importantly, um, disciplinary champions from all major humanities disciplines who are already doing their good work in terms of um, data management to exchange on really everyday issues around data workflows, data management plans and the like that affect the working conditions of arts and humanities. So if you are interested, I put here the, um, connect, uh, the contact information and after the presentation, I gonna uh, share my slides with you so you can follow up. Um, and at this point, you may realize that um, I've been talking about Daria and research infrastructures in the past couple of minutes without even slightly mentioning open science, right? So still, I think that like you may ask, okay, where is the, or actually, where is the open science in all this? Um, I think that all these activities, doing the research in collaborative ways, building support structures for knowledge sharing, uh, working on standards um, are open science at its finest, but still in many cases, it's not enough to do open science implicitly. We also need to be explicit because um, on the other hand, um, like we can easily, in many cases we see this, we feel this huge implementation gap between the generic values of the open research culture and research realities in the arts and humanities. So we frequently encounter even limitations when we try to translate these principles into our everyday practices. Sometimes we do not feel addressed by open science keywords like what is reproducibility, what does it mean for us, um, like what is pre-registration and the like. So at Daria, um, it's a strategic commitment of ours to change this for the better and increase the profile of arts and humanities practices that are coming from these practices, but are genuinely open practices in big open science agendas. Also because um, having a look at the research funding conditions, um, it's not only the question of whether open science will ever be inclusive with arts and humanities, but also about the well-being and the future of art, our arts and humanities research. So in uh, to close my talk, um, I will give you a couple of pointers and show how we aim to strengthen the open research culture in the humanities across Europe. Um, so first of all, these courses are super important, dedicated discourses. Um, so we nurture and open some of these spaces. As an example, here you can find uh, the Daria Open blog, where we publish news and um, expert interviews, resources, success stories, later maybe also disaster stories um, about uh, uh, practical manifestations of openness in arts and humanities. But it's important that uh, there is a two-way traffic in this respect, like we're also listening uh, to, to researcher needs and we have a help desk service in which, um, to which um, scholars can directly ask their questions about uh, open research culture, open publication culture uh, from us. Um, second, I mentioned already training and advocacy. So we are providing both face-to-face -face and hybrid trainings. Um, importantly, uh, Daria member countries are allowed to uh, request um, open humanities, open science related uh, trainings from us. And we really like if uh, 
our training materials are picked and reused and embedded in university teaching curricula as well. So here you can find an instance from um, Daria Campos. There are lots of um, open science, open data uh, related content on Daria Campos. Um, and when it comes to the feasibility of open research practices um, and, and like how to harmonize them with disciplinary traditions, it's also super important to have, to not to do the work alone, but to have like diverse communities around who validate our work, who enrich our work, who uh, bring their own issues um, to, to the table. So in addition to uh, the research data management working group, here is another community I want to introduce you. And this is the editorial team of a platform called Open Methods. You can find the um, um, contact information, again, website, Twitter. It's totally legit to you know, open your browser while I'm talking and uh, check it out. So um, this editorial team is now some uh, 28 digital humanities experts, not only from Europe, but from the whole globe who are speaking and curating content together in about 20 languages. And they bring together and filter not only research papers about digital humanities, but also non-traditional content types, blogs, videos, conference slides, podcasts, um, video tutorials, and the like about specifically digital humanities tools and methods in multiple languages because I think in this context, we are well aware that uh, there are a great deal of important scholarship out there that is not written in English. Um, finally, I also uh, mentioned that we are involved in policy making. So part of this work is to continue uh, to continuously check how we can optimize the research environment for humanists. Uh, how we can uh, improve their working conditions for open sharing. And in this respect, one of the most complex challenges that we encounter is publishing one's first monograph, first book, open access. This is really hard to do right under the current funding landscape. So to make this just a little bit easier, um, this year we launched um, an open access book bursary for the publication of one's first monograph in digital humanities. I put the link uh, to my slide to the um, call because the application um, is still open. So I think that's it. I hope uh, we are still in time. Um, I'm gonna put the link to my presentation uh, to the chat and um, the last two, three, last, let's say two slides will um, give you the opportunity to asynchronously discover uh, these resources that I mentioned. Um, I really hope that uh, you enjoyed this uh, showing around at Daria. I hope it was not overwhelming. And uh, sorry for the connection issue uh, once again. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Urzabet. Uh, yeah, connection is not your responsibility field <laughs> so it normally happens during these two years uh, uh, let me remind you that we will have a discussion afterwards after the whole uh, section at 12 10 probably and we will have 30 minutes to talk about various issues presented by our participants our next presenter is pierre munier uh, Pierre Monnier comes from the School for, of Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences, and uh, he is a coordinator of the operas, co-director of the Directory of Open Access Books, and associate director of Open Edition, the French National Infrastructure for Open Scholarly Communication in the SSH. So, Pierre, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So bear with me a second that while I share my screen with you. Okay, here we go. I think my presentation is full screen for you. 
Okay, so um, my presentation here will uh, uh, focus on the presentation of OPRAS, uh, the Open Scholarly Communication Infrastructure in the uh, European Research Area for Social Sciences and Humanities. And uh, it's, uh, I'll try to, to uh, present to you how <clears throat> OPRAS aims at offering digital services and bringing a community of research together uh, to adopt uh, open science principles and open science practices altogether. As a start of my presentation, uh, I uh, just want to say that, uh, of course, OPRAS address, uh, try to address uh, researchers' needs, in uh, European researchers' needs in scholarly communication. But the, the real question is how exactly? So for, for the start of my presentation, I would share with you, I would like to share with you something uh, which has been uh, proposed some years ago by two colleagues from the University of Utrecht, Jeroen Bosman and Bianca Kramer, which is a kind of a modeling of the digital research workflow from the discovery of data uh, to uh, assessment of uh, research outputs <clears throat> and going through different stages of this uh, workflow, such as the analysis of the data and then also the, the writing of uh, uh, the uh, uh, research uh, results, the publication or the sharing, the outreach, and then the assessment. An interesting thing uh, which appears on this uh, uh, modeling is that, as you, as you all know, uh, there are a lot of different tools to support on the market or uh, in the landscape uh, to support uh, the concrete actions or the concrete uh, activities that the researchers in the humanities and social sciences, but in fact for all disciplines, have to do uh, to perform their research. And this landscape is quite fragmented with a lot of tools available, which are not all connected to each other, which are not all interoperable with each other, so that the researcher, and more particularly the researcher in the humanities and social sciences, has to uh, 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 has to, to play with a lot of different tools, technologies, standards, formats, uh, and, and so on to perform his uh, or her uh, uh, work uh, as a researcher alongside this uh, workflow. So basically, as we are in a panel discussing the role of infrastructures uh, at, um, let's say, institutional, national, or European level, one of the main mission of those infrastructures are also to integrate and to coordinate uh, the uh, service and the tools offering for, uh, for the researchers so that uh, it's uh, easier for, for the researchers to work with all these tools. And that's where, uh, in, in fact, uh, OPRAS uh, tries to help not on all the stages of uh, the, the, the research workflow, because of course, uh, there are other infrastructures for the humanities and for the, the social sciences, for example, which are more focused on the, uh, the management of uh, primary sources or, uh, or data, precisely such as uh, uh, Clarine, uh, uh, Daria also, as uh, Ertzebet uh, uh, presented uh, uh, a few minutes ago, um, or CESDA for the, for, for the social sciences, for, uh, for example. Um, or share, for example, but we, OPRAS, we try to help on a different, <clears throat> uh, um, on, on different levels or different stages of this work, uh, uh, research workflow, and more precisely uh, on the writing, publication, and outreach uh, stages. So we try to provide support uh, for, to the researchers to help them uh, uh, publish, write, publish, disseminate, uh, uh, their, uh, their research through publications or more or through uh, more informal uh, ways of communicating. The um, difficulty or the challenges that we, we can experience as researcher in terms of fragmentation of the landscape, fragmentation of the tools, fragmentation of the services, fragmentation of the communities that we can experience, experience as a, a researcher in humanities has been identified uh, by uh, the, uh, uh, the European Research Higher Education and Research Ministries, which are gathered, uh, which are working together and coordinating with each other uh, through the S3, uh, European Strategy uh, Forum for Research Infrastructure. And uh, if you have a look at the roadmap they published in a 
2018, uh, there is a section where for the humanities and social sciences, what they call uh, uh, social and cultural innovation, they identified that there was a gap in terms of coordination of uh, uh, the, uh, the players, the stakeholders, such as the publishers, the service providers, the institutions, uh, uh, the, the platforms, uh, the infrastructures or local or national infrastructures, there was a gap in terms of coordinating them to offer uh, to uh, the researchers a seamless and easy to use uh, environment to help them adopt and facilitate the adoption of open science practices because Ertzebet uh, very rightly uh, uh, showed in one of our slides uh, that uh, there was a huge gap between the principles and the implementation. So the, 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 the role here is to support the implementation. In fact, uh, this year, uh, OPRAS uh, has been uh, rated as a key research infrastructure within the European Union and joined, in fact, uh, the S3 uh, new iteration of uh, the roadmap. So uh, it means that uh, after having identified three years ago that there was a gap and after having us uh, making a proposal to develop an infrastructure, a European infrastructure such as OPRAS to, uh, to address this gap, uh, uh, the S3 uh, forum in fact uh, acknowledged that uh, OPRAS should be supported in the, in the years to come uh, to uh, provide uh, this, uh, uh, this needed infrastructure at European level. Okay, so now the, the question is, what is OPRAS? Uh, and I think that uh, the definition comes quite naturally after my introduction. So OPRAS is the project that tries to develop the research infrastructure to support open scholarly communication in the SSH within the European research area. Our mission, as I said, is to coordinate and to federate the resources in Europe uh, uh, in terms of scholarly communication to address uh, the SSH researchers need. And our vision, of course, is to make open science uh, uh, practice by default a reality for the uh, SSH re researchers and to fill uh, this implementation gap that has been uh, rightly identified. Um, if we count the total number of researchers in, in Europe, uh, which could be impacted and, on, and helped uh, by this kind of infrastructure, uh, uh, you see that it's uh, uh, around uh, 670,000. Uh, so it's a huge number and uh, uh, it means that uh, uh, there is also a strong responsibility and also a, a specific challenge to, to provide services to this wide diversity of researchers across so many countries and disciplines. That's why also uh, we, we, we took a distribu uh, distributive approach so OPRAS uh, is a distributed infrastructure. Uh, the idea is not to have, a, let's say, a central headquarter or a central team developing services and doing everything for everyone. It wouldn't work, and particularly in the humanities and social sciences where you have such a diversity of uh, languages, cultures, uh, uh, countries, disciplines, and research practices, to be honest. Uh, so, to address the needs, the common needs of this uh, uh, so diverse community, it's important <clears throat> to uh, propose a distributed approach. So, we have around 60 members currently. We are a young infrastructure. We are not at all at the same stage of development as Daria because we are really younger. Uh, we are not an Eric yet. Uh, we are really in our preparation phase. And we have uh, currently, we have 60, uh, 60 members that can be uh, university presses, publishers, platforms, service providers, infrastructures at the uh, institutional or national level, libraries, of course, uh, working together in a cooperative way across the different European countries uh, to, uh, to align themselves, to coordinate and to develop services together. The important point is that when I take back now the modeling of the research workflow that has been proposed by uh, uh, Jan Bussmann and Bianca Kramer, the important point is to see that each of our members propose some services or some tool at a specific stage of this research for workflow, but none of them propose services across the whole workflow. So that's important. That, that's the distributed approach that needs a specific coordination. 
So now the, the, the question is how do we coordinate the community? How do we provide this coordination service that is needed by the community? So the first way and the main way, in fact, is to, uh, uh, to elaborate and to work uh, with the community uh, within what we call special interest groups, which is quite um, similar to, to working groups. Um, and I, uh, my role now is to present to you, uh, or I'd like to present to you uh, the different special interest groups that exist currently. Each of them is coordinated by one of our core members and they address the different topics which are related to the question of open scholarly communication in SSH. So we have, for example, a, a, a SIG dedicated to advocacy uh, for uh, open science towards researchers. Another one which is dedicated to best practice, particularly in editorial practices. Another one which is dedicated to the adoption of technical standards and alignment of uh, service providers and platforms to adopt the same standards to improve interoperability. A one which is dedicated to multilingualism, which is a very important topic for the humanities in particular. Another one dedicated to open access business models. You may know that there are heated deb uh, debates and a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a strong discussion regarding the business models that are needed in the, in the SSH in particular to adopt uh, uh, open access. So we have a working group on that. And we have a, a working group or a special interest group dedicated to the development of tools or research and development for writing and publication tools, and another one for the platforms and services. So the community of OPRAS members, they are gathered inside these different special interest groups. They work together, they collaborate, they meet regularly together to uh, write mainly white papers and to prepare for future collaboration for future uh, projects. Um, I just want to, uh, to insist on one point. Uh, so we have uh, proposed to our different special interest groups to publish a white paper where collectively for each uh, special interest group, they identify, uh, um, let's say, the state of, the state of art uh, of the domain, the gaps, they identify the gaps in the community regarding uh, the implementation of the state of art and they, um, they also uh, try to foresee future projects that could uh, help the community. And uh, we have done that exercise once uh, three years ago uh, and all the white papers coming from the different special interest groups are published on the OPRAS website. And we, have, we are doing a second iteration of this work currently and the different special interest groups have just finished, almost finished, the second version of their white paper that are uh, going to be published very soon on OPRA's website through what we call a living book. Uh, because the living book in, in implies uh, the fact that those white papers will be updated regularly uh, and uh, they, are, they will be also annotable. Uh, so we have implemented an, a free and open annotation layer on top of those white papers on OPRA's website so that the community can comment uh, 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 and discuss around the white papers. And you can find that on, the, on our website. Okay, why do we do that? We do that basically to offer a catalog of services to researchers. So uh, we are currently in the stage of developing services at European level to to serve and to help uh, researchers' needs in terms of scholarly communication. You have a list, a provisional list of the services we are working on in terms of development. Um, and of course, I don't have time to, to present to you all the services. So I just want to make a focus on some services which are currently developed or in, in the stage of development. I just want to focus on one current service that has been presented at OASPA conference uh, recently by uh, our uh, uh, colleague uh, Neil Stern from uh, the DOAB Foundation. And this is the certification service, which is really interesting, particularly for the humanities. Because the books and the research monographs published by the humanities with uh, the help of the academic publishers, of course, they are peer reviewed. But there is some uh, lack of transparency or, or lack of information regarding what is exactly the procedure of peer reviewing or the uh, practice of peer reviewing which is applied to the different books which are published. So uh, with the DOAB, we, we developed uh, a certification service 
where uh, the, the point is to help the, the publishers describe uh, in a very transparent and easy to read way, uh, the peer review procedure that has been applied to the books which are registered into the directory of open access book. So here, the point is to bring more uh, clarity, information and transparency regarding the peer review procedure applied to open access books, academic books, to increase the trust of the community uh, regarding uh, this uh, procedure and the, the uh, quality assurance uh, applied to the books. Uh, at the same time, we are developing two, service, two services uh, through European projects. And I just want to refer to you here to uh, two projects which are ongoing. So the triple project, I have you, have, or you have talked a little bit about it uh, uh, in your presentation because uh, Daria also is, is part of this project. Uh, the triple project aim is to develop a discovery service at European level to help researchers, citizens, uh, and other stakeholders discover uh, open uh, humanities and social sciences content, uh, materials, pro, uh, profiles, and projects uh, to increase the reuse uh, and the impact of the research in humanities and social sciences at European and international level. So this is the triple platform, the triple project, sorry. And on the other side, we have another project named COESO, we, which started some months ago, which is to develop a platform to help and facilitate participatory research between researchers and uh, citizens at European level through the support to pilot projects and development of a platform. I don't go into details as well, but you have the website if you are interested by this original approach of citizen science dedicated and uh, fit for the humanities and social sciences, which is through participatory uh, research. Uh, we have uh, currently an AISBL, we are not an ERIC, but an uh, international association uh, based in Brussels. Uh, we have a, a governance scheme with the General Assembly, an Executive Assembly, an Assembly of the Commons that gathers all OPRAS members. We have a, a scientific board. So we have, let's say, the governance scheme, but the most, most important thing is that behind the scheme, you have a lot of people. And that's the, 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 the interesting and uh, uh, let's say the, the, the positive side of, of this governance where we have a lot of people coming from different countries, different disciplines, participating to all these boards and helping uh, operas grow and mature uh, in a very collaborative way. Uh, we are situated and collaborating with our neighbors in our environment. Uh, and I just want to, to, to show you that uh, we're already collaborating, of course, with the, uh, Europe, um, the, the, the uh, higher education and research ministries in the European countries, but also with our sister infrastructures, uh, such as Daria, uh, uh, Clarin, CESDA, SHARE, uh, and ESS, uh, more, but more particularly with uh, Daria through uh, common projects in particular. Uh, and also because Daria is one of our supporting members. Uh, so we are uh, in intensively collaborating with those uh, system infrastructures at European level. We are also collaborating with e-infrastructures such as EGI and OpenAir at European level. And we are also participating to the EOSC, the building of the EOSC uh, at uh, uh, European level. And we are also involved into uh, some international uh, initiatives. Uh, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer questions if you have uh, questions about those international uh, initiatives we are collaborating with. Okay, so this is the recap of our trajectory. Uh, our aim is to, uh, uh, let's say, in the time frame of uh, the next eight years, uh, to uh, become an ERIC as well, uh, and to uh, uh, to mature, to be in, op in full operation with a, a, ca a full catalog of services and uh, the full capacity to coordinate all the communities. Uh, and we are uh, in our preparation phase uh, going into this uh, direction. And of course, uh, we are an open infrastructure in many ways, but let's say that the most natural way to be open is to be open to new members to join us. So uh, you can see on our website, I've put the link on my, in my slide 
uh, that uh, you have a small presentation helping you if you if you are interested uh, discover and understand why and how you could join operas and join the community uh, basically uh, to work with uh, uh, your colleagues our colleagues uh, in uh, the operas community and that's it thank you very much for your attention thank you pierre very much for this extensive presentation and we now move to Frédéric Claver from the Luxembourg Center for Contemporary and Digital History. Uh, Frédéric, uh, before joining the center in Luxembourg, worked as a researcher in Strasbourg, the Center for Virtual de la Connaissance l'Europe, uh, and uh, also he worked at the University of Lausanne. His research focuses on three main areas, the history of economic and monetary organization across the European continent in the 20th and 21st centuries, collective memory of the past in the age of big data, and the relationship between historians and their digital primary sources. The title of the presentation is Narration, Hermeneutics and Data, the Multilayered Article and the Journal of Digital History. So please, Frederic. Good morning. Um... Uh, thanks for the invitation first uh, and sorry I joined late uh, because I did a stupid mistake mistake about uh, the time. Uh, so now I'm going to share my screen and we'll start my presentation. Oops. So. so what I'm going to speak about today is um, the Journal of Digital History. The Journal of Digital History is um, not, um, has not yet released any issue. It's going to, uh, to be released. It was scheduled for the 27th. We are a bit late. Uh, the official launch date now, it's uh, on the 18th of October, and we've got still some articles that are almost ready. Um, well, basically, the Journal of Digital History is an open access with no fees for authors, peer reviewed uh, international journal of history. The aim is to um, implement the principle of multi layered article. By multi layered article, uh, we mean articles that will have a narrative layer, which is basically the usual article that we published, an hermeneutics layer, which is everything about methods, but also the code and the access to, to, um, to data. So it's more or less scheduled for data-driven articles and data-driven research. And we aimed at using transmedia storytelling, which is a bit hard uh, to uh, define, uh, but basically we will use all the possibilities and the authors will use all the possibilities of um, HTML5 and CSS to, to have, to be able um, to, um, to present um, their results and their methods. So um, let's go a bit into detail uh, about the multi-layered article. So as I said, um, there will be a narration layer involving transmedia storytelling, but an hermeneutic layer and a data layer. Uh, and this multi-layered article is, is supposed to allow us first to, um, <clears throat> um, to um, promote data-driven scholarship and better storytelling about our research. Uh, and we foster critical debate in digital history. Um, basically, the difference between the difference between the narration layer and the hermeneutic layer is it's sometimes a bit hard to do. It's some, what the, the experience we have with our authors is that sometimes uh, narrating and doing methods uh, are things that are really intricate, that are really linked to each other. So to explain the difference between the narration layer and the hermeneutic layer to authors, what I tell them is the following thing. When you've got 
a digital history article to publish, usually the journal will ask you to remove a lot about the methods that you used just to get the results and to go straight to the results. So imagine that the amenetic layer is all the parts of your article that a traditional history journal will ask you to remove. So that is a definition, a pragmatic definition that usually is uh, interest a lot the authors, but basically the amenetic layer is here for methods, to, de for, to detail the, your methods, your digital method, the digital tools you, um, you, uh, you used and the code you wrote with, and we will allow the, the readers to access the code and when possible, the data. The data layer is basically just the data set itself stored in a, um, in a Dataverse instance that we installed at the University of Luxembourg. I did not mention it yet, but the Journal of Digital History as a publisher, it's a joint venture be between the C2DH and the Greuter in Berlin. Um, so now just some insight on the Journal of Digital History infrastructure. Um, basically, the infrastructure is based on open source software that we link together with a code with, with our own code. It's based on data on a dataverse instance for the storing of the data. Um, Jupyter notebooks and at one point lab in the future, Jupyter Labs, um, as an editor for the articles. Um, a Git server in the future, but for now GitHub uh, to, um, for the communication with the authors about their articles and, uh, and the storage of the articles before they are published. And then we are using all the possibilities of the HTML5 to uh, basically go from the notebook to the, the published article on, on the website of the Journal of Digital History. Um, today I'm going to speak a bit more about the author's point of view and a bit about the reader. Um, basically what we ask from, for, from the authors is to write, is to write the article with a Jupyter notebook. So, uh, don't really know if you all know what is a Jupyter notebook, but a Jupyter notebook is basically um, a way to edit code and to allow that the code you write will be easily reproducible uh, by the users of the notebooks. So it's based on cells and cells can be marked on cells or so text cells or code cells and then from the notebook that the authors will deliver, we pass the cells and make it a proper article online. So we've got basically um, cells in Markdown that will be passed into a title, then the abstract, the authors, keywords, etc., And then we will pass different kinds of cells uh, to the different layers so to the narration layer or to the amenetics layer. Um, I, I will show you a concrete example of an article because there is one article that is today fully reviewed and accepted. Um, so I will show you the website so that you can, uh, you can, you can see the, the results because from what I'm saying yet, it's quite abstract. Um, the screen design is supposed to, so the, the website interface is, to, is supposed to translate this multi-layered article principle, principle into the website. Um, that's where I'm going to show you my, um, to show you the website. Um, so basically, This is a notebook stored on GitHub with all the code and then the text. And this notebook will be displayed 
on the website this way. So when you will land on an article page, you will basically land on the narration layer. Each time there is a cell code on the notebook, you will be able to show it and then to read the code and to read that's the code, but sometimes there are text about the methods, for instance, here. Those are cells that are from the amenities layer. Of course, you might be interested also in looking only at the amenities. So you can switch to the amenities layer fully. And there it will be the opposite. So the narration, the narrative um, part will be hidden. And you will access directly everything that is about the amenities layer so the code and all the methodological um, texts that is here to explain your methods you've got here on the right uh, the table of contents of the article that is generated automatically from the markdown cells with a grammar that is supposed to to give you from the first sight uh, the nature of the title and the following paragraphs. So basically, if, if it's around, it's narration. And if it's this layer-based, multi-layered icon, it's um, amenities. And you've got some smaller icons from, for the figures, tables, etc. So you can, from the table of contents, um, guess what this paragraph or title is about. Of course, oh, let's need to go back to the narrative layer, sorry. Of course, we, um, we are using, okay, it doesn't want to work this time, okay. We are using, um, we are using Zotero uh, and a small extension for Jupyter uh, notebooks that links the notebook to Zotero. Uh, to generate automatically all uh, bibliographic references uh, that, uh, that allow us uh, to, um, uh, to, to format the bibliographic references as we wish. And that's also a bit simpler for the authors. So because the guidelines to write the articles are already quite complicated because if you never use Jupyter notebooks, even if you're familiar with writing code, uh, that can be um, that can take you um, sometimes before you just set up before you you, you manage to write something. Um, okay, so let's go back to the presentation. We've got, if you're interested, a viewer tools. It's what I just used because the article I showed you is not published yet. It's not on the website, but if you've got a notebook, if you want to see, to check the compatibility with the Journal of Digital History Infrastructure, then you've got a tool for that. Now, <clears throat> why did we uh, basically choose Jupyter Notebooks? Um, we needed an editor. It was not possible to develop it from scratch. That would have been too long. And it's too complicated when you develop something from scratch, uh, then to, um, to, to, to just develop it further. Uh, so we wanted something well-established, easy to learn. Um, and well established by well-established, I mean that with a strong community, uh, around it, uh, so that we quite sure we we are quite sure that the the, the editor we, we chose will not be abandoned in the next few years. Uh, we wanted executable articles, as you saw, um, and an, and an editor that is able to combine code, data, and and media elements. So an editor that correspond to these multi layer principles. Um, 
and basically um, notebooks were the best thing we could get. Um, we did some research on existing online editors. It was not the only candidate, but it was the best candidate uh, because there is a wide community behind it. And because basically it is, there is an ecosystem around uh, Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Labs that allowed us to uh, extend it if we needed to, and that allowed us to um, combine code, data, media element, text, etc. Um, the only problem of notebooks, well, there are some advantages for some other advantages for notebooks about notebooks, for instance, um, up to 30 languages are supported, but mainly Python and R and Julia, which are the three main languages used in digital humanities, um, usually produces similar outputs, and those outputs can be stored within the notebooks. So that was the executed code uh, is available as output, and that was quite important when we published the article. The problem of notebooks is that the document structure is very poor and that they are, it's not made to handle bibliographic references. But hopefully, um, we can use Markdown to structure the document and for the, um, bibliograph the ending of the bibliographic reference, there is this small extension that, that links to Dotero, which is called site to see The only problem being that it's compatible for now with Jupyter Notebook, but not with Jupyter Lab, um, and does not seem to be um, heavily developed anymore. But if there is only this part that we have to develop, that will be um, that will be okay. So we chose Jupyter Notebook as an editor. Um, I will show you a bit more how uh, Notebook works in a few minutes. Uh, just to conclude the presentation part, um, the Journal of Digital History will, um, will publish issues as a stream so we are not going to publish all articles of an issue at the same time. Um, uh, basically, because it's not necessary anymore when you're online. Uh, uh, maybe Pierre Mounier has a different ID because he, he has a, a, a strongest experience in online publishing. Uh, but we, we felt that it was not necessary to publish all the articles of an issue at the same time. But the second reason, which is maybe um, more important is that for each article, uh, there is a very strong workload for the team at the C2DH um, because we need to, uh, to be sure that it's uh, technically possible to publish them. I mean, all those articles will um, ask to access different kinds of languages or different kinds of libraries. Um, so we, we need to, um, to create almost a small development environment for each article, and that takes time. And it takes a lot of time to, um, uh, to format a bit uh, the notebook to be sure that it's compatible with the, uh, the website infrastructure. So just to give you an idea of how we developed that, we developed that, we, we all need, in terms of development since uh, September 2020, and we hoped to uh, basically published the first issue after one year. We are almost there. We are a bit late, but not that much. Uh, so I will keep you updated uh, in something like three weeks, two to three weeks, um, when the first article will be out. Um, now we will go back to GitHub and just show you a bit how we structure those. Um, the notebooks. So on the final version of the um, of the website, when um, when 
the first article will be out. There will be a My Binder button, which will allow the user to launch the notebook within My Binder. And so the user will be able to interact with the code and when possible with the data through this system. Okay. Just a minute, please. I prefer not to launch, launch it. <laughs> um, I usually prefer to, um, to launch um, my binder or not to, uh, uh, before the presentation because there are many errors, but I did not know that there would be this, this error. Um, just a question, how did you, um, I will try again. How did you um, schedule the, the question session? Uh, we are running out of time for this presentation. So if you, uh, okay, if you so, have a few more minutes to finish. Okay, so basically it's, it's, it's not a problem. What we do is that for each cell, so I, I will not show you how it works concretely, but for each cell, you can tag the cell and the tagging will help us know if you want this cell to go to the um, hermeneutics layer or to the narrative layer. So code cells will be automatically displayed in the, in the hermeneutics layer, unless you tag it as narrative and text cells will be automatically sent to the narration layer unless you tag it as, as hermeneutics. Our experience with authors, because all along this process, all along this year, we regularly spoke with our authors to, to have their feedback. And the main issue for them was to make the difference between the hermeneutics layer and the narrative layer. And the difference between the two layers were basically um, um, changing from one article to the other. So I think I will stop there if we are, if we are a, bit, uh, a bit late. And I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Frederic. Uh, so now we have time uh, to put questions. Uh, we can proceed simply by doing this in two ways. You can write in the chat uh, session your questions to our presenters, or you can raise your hand in this reactions mode, and then we will see uh, we will see you among the. Uh, people want to ask questions. So we have the first question to Erjabet. What does it mean to be a member country of Daria, both for an institution and individual? What does it implicate in comparison to non-member institutions? And uh, how does it work with non-EU countries? Yes, thanks a lot uh, for this very nice set of questions. I tried to answer them quickly and straightforwardly. Um, so first of all, I think it's important to highlight that um, um, if a country is a full DARIA member country, it means that it's not only the scholarly community who around digitally enabled humanities who managed to organize themselves into a national consortia first, because this is one entry uh, point to DARIA first, uh, it has to be a national consortium between certain institutions. So digital humanities or humanities working with digital first have to um, uh, step on this institutionalization route on a national. And this is one part of the story. The second part of the story, I think um, this is also a reason why Daria member countries are super lucky because uh, it involves contribution from national ministries, membership, paying membership fees from national ministries of uh, science, innovation, research ministries. And this means that if you are a DARIA member country, then also your government, also your ministry recognize the value of digital arts and humanities uh, scholarship. So this is really a privilege, I would say. And um, it also means that um, like, 
probably it's not the most fortunate metaphor, but imagine them as shareholders, like these ministries and the national scholarly communities who have a vote in the areas governance. So they can shape priorities, what, what we should do collectively, collectively, how we should uh, uh, organize, spend those resources collectively. So this is something, this voting, shaping elements is, is, is definitely a benefit. Also, um, it means uh, sharing a lot of internal insights, picking each other's brain. Um, uh, there are certain set of services that are available only for uh, DARIA member countries through DARIA authentication, authorization, uh, in shared infrastructure. But this is just a subset of our services. Um, what is, uh, and, and they can also like, uh, definitely a benefit that I mentioned, they can uh, pick our brain on strategic areas of ours, like open science for sure. Um, but probably more importantly, um, what is also a very important added benefit is that they can collectively apply for EU projects, collectively attract funding, which with the help of which funding um, they gain resources to um, improve and connect uh, their own national institutional infrastructural components as well. So collectively attracting funding is a super important um, added benefits of uh, membership. But um, so these are the added values, I would say. But on the other hand, and this is a balance, a sensitive balance, it's super important to highlight that Daria, as my, I touched upon in my presentation, has a strong commitment to openness, right? Like making uh, almost all our services, all our training materials and the like available to everybody open access. So this is for you, even if there for you, even if you are a, a non-member country, because we see the value in that and we believe that uh, it will return anyway. Um, regarding your question of uh, how about uh, countries outside of the EU for this, uh, we have um, the um, cooperating partnership uh, schema. Uh, so there are uh, countries like the UK, for instance, who are uh, non-EU member countries, but uh, are still on their way, are uh, already cooperating partners to Daria. Obviously, they don't um, pay uh, membership fees, um, so they have less privileges, less advantages, um, but still it's a tighter form of, um, of um, uh, thinking together, building things together. Uh, and I also mentioned Switzerland as an observer member who um, is in um, quite a similar status. Um, maybe my colleague, uh, Edward, can also uh, add to this uh, if um, Ed is here with us. No? Okay. Uh, then uh, that's my answer in brief. Thank you, Erzsébet. We have also a question to Pierre. Uh, tools and services provided and maintained by commercial companies still play an important role in the scholarly communication as well. What would be the view towards these services within the Opera's infrastructure? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you for, for um, uh, firing it at me. Um, so uh, we are, there is no problem uh, to have services and tools developed and proposed by commercial companies as such. Uh, the status, let's say the fiscal status of the company is not a problem as such. The, the real question is about several things. It's about, so just, just uh, before I go in this di direction, I just like to, to tell you that, for example, inside the Opera's community, we have several commercial companies, whether they are publishers, such as Lexis in uh, the north of Italy, or they are uh, tools and service uh, providers, such as Net7 in Pisa in Italy. Uh, Net7 is a well-known uh, company uh, for the DH community because they develop a lot of services for the DH community, such as Muruka, for example, and Pundit and others. Uh, so we welcome them in our community. And for example, for those two uh, commercial companies, we are really, really happy to, to, to work with them in our projects and to think with them and to develop services uh, uh, in cooperation with them. But the important thing 
And the important thing is on, on different levels. First, it's very important that the code developed by those commercial companies is open source. That's, that's let's say, a first condition uh, so that there is no uh, uh, lock-in uh, on the code itself uh, due to uh, uh, the inte intellectual property right. And there is a possibility for the community to take the code, to reuse it, adapt it, develop it, and so on. So all the benefits you already know for which are attached to uh, uh, open, uh, open source code on one side. But that's, uh, that's not enough, I would say. The other conditions are linked to the question of the governance of the development of the tools and the governance of the services. So it is also very important that the scholarly community stays in control of the governance of the services, whether it be directly or indirectly. So uh, that's what, uh, for example, uh, Geoffrey Builder, Jennifer Lin, and, and Cameron Nalen uh, uh, call an open infrastructure. Uh, they have been, uh, uh, they, they have published uh, uh, one or two years ago a very important paper uh, named The Principles of Open Infrastructure, mentioning that the importance that, yes, we can. Uh, work with commercial companies, that's not a problem as such, but it's important that certain conditions are met, such as precisely the control of the scholarly community over the governance of those services or over those infrastructures through open, and open governance and the capacity for the scholarly uh, uh, community to stay in control of the, of the governance. I don't go into concrete details about how to implement those principles because it's quite complex, it's a whole work, but at least you have, you have the approach. And uh, that's what uh, OPRAS is working on precisely. So I give you an example. Uh, I've, uh, I've made a focus on two uh, services that are currently under development by uh, OPRAS through the two projects, Triple on one side and Coeso on the other side. So it implies the development of two platforms to be, uh, to be, uh, to be honest. Part of the development of uh, one of the two platforms is uh, done by a public institution, so the French CNRS, but another part and some components inside the platform, the triple platform, are developed by Net7. And on the COESO project, uh, the main, let's say, uh, uh, the, the core part of the platform will, is, is currently developed by Net7. So within the project, we are not only uh, collaborating and working with Net7, as an example, on the technical side, the co-design, for example, of the service and the technical implementation and the technical development of the service. We are also working with them on the governance side and the, uh, the future sustainability of the service to stay in control of the scholarly community. And they, they are absolutely willing to do that, of course. We are really uh, cooperating with us on that. And that's, I think this is a, a strong and a very positive basis to develop cooperations with commercial companies or private companies that can bring a lot of positive things into uh, collaborative uh, projects such as the one we're doing with them. Thank you, Pierre. We have uh, also uh, several questions to, to, questions to Frederic. I will read them aloud. Uh, so the first question concerns possible entry barriers both from the author's side and from the reviewer's side. So do you have capacities to support authors in publishing the Jupyter notebooks? Do you have challenges finding reviewers for this type of scholarship? And the second question, can you tell us a bit about your collaboration with the Gruyter? Do you have challenges accommodating all these innovations uh, to a publishing house workflow? Please, Frederick. Now that, that's a very interesting question and quite a lot of questions at the same time, but that, that are really important. Uh, yet there is an entry barrier and there is a learning curve for the notebook. Um, so what we did uh, up to now, and, and we were inspired, for instance, by, uh, by the work of Open Edition for the, the, the blogging platform, hypothes.org, uh, one of the key to success of Hypothes was to have regular workshops with potential 
uh, with, with researchers and, and potential users uh, so, so that they, they could easily learn how to use WordPress. In our case, for the Jupyter Notebooks, what we did, we started with workshops with the authors, presenting them several uh, possible editors, and we asked them, so the, the authors for the first issue, and we, we, we asked them uh, which editor that they preferred, and they obviously all preferred Jupyter Notebooks. Um, and then, some some people now, some authors now, uh, are used to, uh, to 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 write code, but not necessarily to write code with notebook. For them, there is a small learning curve. Um, the problem is more uh, authors who works with developers, uh, and in that case, the developer usually knows notebooks and use them, but not the author not the historian so what we do is to organize workshop regular workshop and each time an abstract is submitted on the on on, on the website um, i meet virtually the authors and i show them how a notebook, a notebook works uh, and the guidelines we are quite precise about how to install them on your computer so we try really to be present with the authors and if an author needs to um, to talk to uh, to the team then we organize a virtual session a virtual meeting uh, so we we meet the authors when they need to uh, when, when they need something uh, so the the training part uh, is quite um, is quite uh, important um, but up to now there were no real problem with notebooks to be honest um, knowing the basics of notebooks is not much more difficult than the basics of LibreOffice Writer or, or, or Microsoft Word. In fact, I tend to consider that Word is much more complicated than notebooks, but that may be only my opinion, but <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's just an opinion of someone who hates Word. But um, um, that's for the first question, and uh, I, uh, I hope I, I answered it. The second question, um, do you have challenges, challenges finding reviewers for this type of scholarship? Yes and no. Uh, so we, we are doing a peer review. We are organizing a, a peer review process, and there will be two reviews for each article. One review from a member of the board who are usually who knows usually how to use notebooks and and who followed us uh, during this year of development. So usually it's okay. The problem is the other reviewer who is an external reviewer. And usually if I choose a reviewer from the board who is not on the code development part side, I will try to find someone who, um, an external reviewer who will be more code savvy. And if the member of the board is code savvy, then I will find an external reviewer who will not look at the code, but who will look at the narration part or the methods parts, but not the code. So I try to balance a bit. Um, what we do is that they will, the, the reviewers receive the three links. The first link is to GitHub. The second link is to a my, a my binder uh, version of the not good of the notebook that we checked. And the third link will be with the notebook preview previewer on the website. So it will be the article within uh, the environment of the journal of digital history. So they can really review the three. Um, so it, I had a review of someone uh, from someone who never heard about Jupyter Notebooks, who has never written any line of code. And that was good. That was okay because she focused really on the scientific part, on the research part. And the internal reviewer for this article was really someone who could read code and assess the quality of the code. The only thing for now is that we don't have form, formal criteria to assess the code. 
and the data sets. That's a bit tricky to do. That's, that's something we, we need to develop and to, uh, to further think about. And now this, the third question, which is the, um, the work with the Goiter. So the Goiter is interested by the project because they want to think about the future of publishing, basically. And that's why they, they were interesting and supportive from the beginning. Um, but we need discussions about how to integrate the Journal of Digi Digital History within their workflow. Uh, and that's not, and I don't think they will, um, uh, they, they, they will see this as negative, but that's not always easy. And for instance, uh, there is still a discussion that is not closed about what we do with the articles on the Degorator's website. The DUI must lead to a permanent version of the article. Uh, and so must lead to the Degorator's website, for instance. So there will be always two versions, unfortunately for now, of the, uh, of the articles, a PDF, but with nothing um, interactive with it that will be uh, on the degrader websites uh, and with in this pdf uh, many incentives to go to the website um, so links QR codes things like that we are still not sure of everything about that we're still discussing it um, so there were some difficulties but that's um, in the end, that's part of the game. Um, the publisher is needed because there is um, um, a savoir-faire, that know-how that we don't have. We are not publishers. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is also a strong force of the greater for all everything's marketing, and that's also an important part of publishing. Uh, but we, we need some time to, to discuss details and workflows, yes. And it's not always easy, but we always have a solution because we both, we all want to succeed. I have a few more questions to Frederick. Uh, one is a general fear that uh, open access leads to the kind of leveling of the quality of uh, the author's text. So how the author is protected. Then there is another question from your hand who, who can pose it aloud. Prošu Johane. Vam treba rozmutati mikrofon. Dobroho dnia mene čuti? Patrick, you can use the translation interpretation bar. Uh, yes. Look at I will try. Yeah. Let's be interactive. <laughs> so just select the language and then. Ah, I selected English. Yeah, you select English and we can speak Ukrainian. Yes. <laughs> so I selected English. Okay, Prosho. Можна, да? Це місто Житомир, Україна. Системний адміністратор Державної архіву Житомирської області. Дивіться, ви дуже змістовну версію дали, показали інтерактивно, дуже все працює ну, бездоганно. Але таке питання, дивіться, якщо датаверс, ви описали, ну, потім HTML5, інтеграція, це дуже класно. Але наскільки редактор захищений у вільному доступу? Тобто у нас на Питання питання про захист та збереження інформації. Це питання від архіва, я як системний адміністратор, тобто по захисту. Дякую. And before Frederic you proceed, there is also a question from Pierre Monier to you. So who has the property of the journal? You or DG? This is an important question and a way to address Rustin. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by property of the journal. Basically, all articles will be um, published in Creative Commons. Uh, so, um, 
that, that the first part. Um, it's apart from the PDF I talked about, everything is hosted at the University of Luxembourg. And I think that the name Journal of Digital History as a trademark uh, belongs to the university. And the code, all the code we develop is open access. Uh, I'm not sure it's answered totally your, yeah, it, it did. Um, I, I'm not sure I understood the question about o, 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 open access and protection. Yeah, um, people have this fear that uh, if someone else has continuous access to your kind of narrative part or whatever text, if it if this might lead to the kind of leveling of the text. So how the, how the author is protected? Um, it's not because it, it's open access that it's allowed to copy it. Um, uh, people can quote it, that's why it's uh, under Creative Commons. But uh, if you need uh, to quote the articles, you are supposed to quote it fairly, so to, to quote it fairly, so to, uh, to quote the authors, uh, to quote the right text, etc. And in the end, it's rather easy when it's open access to control who uh, would have copied your text without mentioning you, in fact. It's, it's, it's really easy and there are software for that. Um, and if your journal is not open access, or for instance, if it's only a print journal, if it's not online, uh, I think, to be honest, that uh, it's easier to, um, to go for plagiarism because it's harder to find the source of a plagiarism if it's only printed and not online. So I think the, the authors are quite well protected. I don't see it as an issue. Being using a Creative Commons uh, license and being open access does not mean that it allows people to do everything they want to. That's something very important and strong to state. So they are protected, yes. And that's although the um, and that's also one of the work of the Goiter because they've got, in terms of plagiarism, quite a lot of experience to, I mean, to fight against plagiarism. That's although the interest of having this joint venture with the Goiter. I hope I answered your, your question. Uh, there is another question, I think, if I can answer it directly. Go ahead, please. So I, I was also curious to learn about the first authors, disciplines, background, projects, topics. Okay. Um, they are coming from all periods of history. So we've got some, some um, two articles about ancient history. We've got, um, if I remember well, we've got one, uh, medieval history article, and we've got quite a lot, lot of contemporary history articles. So on the 20th century and about the 19th century and about the 20th century, and even the 21st, because there is one article about Twitter data and uh, the centenary of the First World War, which is not by me. Um, so it's quite large. Uh, what we, one of the consequences is that we, we, we just saw that we should have a board with a bit more people because we, we lack ancient historians uh, on this board. And, and we need, as the board, the scientific board, the academic board is implied in articles with the reviews, we so need. Um, we need uh, more ancient historians, so, so uh, we are going to, to work about that. Um, concerning topics, it's quite large. There is one article, for instance, that is using um, LDA, Latin Dirichlet allocation, so text mining uh, on large sets of data, so digitized newspaper, uh, and they're using LDA, they, they are trying to set up a method uh, to use LDA to create uh, representative samples of big data, of 
digitize of large amount of digitize uh, digitize newspaper data uh, that's an example of topics there is there are some uh, one article that is a speech analysis of a latin author there is um uh, there is another article about um, uh, extra legal violence in the United States, for instance. So it's quite large. It's, it's really diverse. We, we don't want, we want to be a general history journal in terms of themes that you can write articles about. Our specificity, it's the data driven part and the multi layer article. Okay, thank you, Frederic, and thank you all participants of this session, Ergebeto Tifra, Pierre Munier, and then Frederic Claver. We have uh, now 20 minutes break. You can stay here connected, or you uh, can drop this connection and then reconnect uh, at uh, yeah one o'clock by Ukrainian time, but uh, it's Maybe Taras has me. Yes, eight, 18 minutes from now. So uh, we have a short break and we will start uh, in 18 minutes. Uh, one small note from my side as well. We were thinking that maybe this break could be an opportunity to have sort of, uh, let's say, open mic. Maybe some of the participants want to, I don't know, share projects that they are uh, participating in uh, in the chat or uh, let uh, the audience know more about themselves. So th this break would be the opportunity to do so. Uh, so I encourage you also to, to use this uh, break this way. And yes, uh, we will see in 17 minutes from now uh, for our next session with uh, title tools and frameworks. Uh, so see you soon.
Okay, I think I should slowly start our next session. I can see OXC as a moderator for the for this session is present. I also can see our speakers for this session, Edward Laur. Uh, Reiner is also here. Uh, so yes. Okay, without further ado, let's uh, move on to our next uh, session after research and infrastructure, uh, research infrastructures and communication, we are going to discuss more tools and frameworks uh, from also various fields, but I think it's also quite relevant for our audience to learn more about those uh, uh, possibilities, those opportunities that uh, will be presented during this session. And I will give the floor to Oleksi to present our speakers. Thank you very much uh, and uh, uh, good uh, day, morning or other time of <laughs> the day uh, to everyone. Um, I think we will wait, let's say, half a minute to uh, all the people to come back to bring their coffees uh, and uh, uh, set up our, uh, com uh, our uh, communication. So our uh, panel, which is already announced, uh, is a continuation of the uh, very intense and very interesting start uh, to, uh, of the seminars we have in the morning. At this panel, we have uh, a quite interesting combination of uh, presenters from uh, with background in humanities and uh, uh, with background uh, in uh, engineering, computing, and uh, uh, technical side of uh, uh, digital humanity uh, projects. Uh, and um, uh, now we uh, can start with our third presentation, uh, sharing digital tools in, uh, context, uh, in context, the SSH Open uh, Marketplace. This presentation will be delivered by Edward Gray and uh, Laure Barbu. Edward uh, received his PhD from Purdue University and uh, currently uh, he is working and as research infrastructure coordinator at the uh, 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 TGIR Human Non and uh, the uh, Officer for National Co uh, Coordination at the at DARIA. Uh, also, he works as uh, 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 he works for for the uh, uh, Open uh, uh, Market uh, Marketplace uh, uh, project uh, and uh, coordinating uh, task forces uh, for this project uh, and. Um, uh, Laure Bar uh, Barbu is a uh, European project officer at DARIA and uh, she uh, coordinates uh, 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 work uh, on the SHS Open Marketplace uh, 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 de uh, development, but also uh, she uh, worked in uh, many other projects, for example, French uh, research infrastructure for social science and humanities, and uh, she also was a European pro uh, project man uh, manager uh, for the University of Toulouse. So with all this rich experience, our speakers is, uh, are working uh, on their uh, current project. And uh, I invite you to share with us uh, uh, the, uh, your, your presentation. And uh, you have 20 minutes before it's your. Thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning still. <laughs> I don't know. I will share my screen first. And like this, you should be full. You should see full screen, right? OK, Which? great. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for having us, we said, uh, to speak about the SSH uh, Open Marketplace. So we will present you this uh, discovery service to share digital tools in context. And the service is still in its, in its uh, beta version. So we are also very keen to receive your opinion about it and then your feedback. And we will share our contacts at the end of the presentation. So really do not hesitate to get in touch uh, with us. We are really happy uh, to, to get some feedback on it also during the discussion session. Um, and uh, this presentation is a result of a collaborative work. So if, we, if you follow the, this link, 
we will also share the presentation after um, uh, afterwards with you. You can also see the whole team that is uh, behind the project. So we are just uh, some kind of uh, ambassadors with Ed today to, to deliver you this, this presentation. So after the, um, the end of this presentation, you should know what is the SSH open marketplace, a bit um, about its history, so where it's come from and how we are working to implement it. And hopefully, and maybe more interestingly for you, uh, what's in it for you and how it can help your, uh, your own research. So I heard that there are some historians in, in the room, and uh, even if it's not the case, we think that it's always interesting to know a bit more about the background and the origins of, of the of infrastructure projects and to understand where uh, the services build up for research communities are actually coming from. So this is what I will try uh, to explain a bit with this first slide. So you can see on the on the right side uh, corner of the of the slide, that uh, if you work in a digital humanities center or in a research library or even as a researcher yourself, you can sometimes um, ask yourself this question, what tool or software should I use? And this is basically the idea behind the SSH Open Marketplace as a discovery platform. So it can be useful to have somewhere some kind of tool directories and tool registries where, uh, or catalogs where you can find and browse among the different tools that are offered uh, for the communities or that are available or sometimes built up by other researchers and that can help you to perform some kind of the digital aspects of your work. But there were previous attempts uh, before the SSH Open Marketplace to build uh, such um, uh, tool directories in the DH context um, and also in the kind of collaborative settings. So you have a great pieces of work from uh, Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford University that explain how the digital research tool directory, so the DIRT directory, actually failed to be sustained after, um, after the Bamboo project went over in the US context. And together with uh, Geoffrey Rockwell, Quinn Dombrowski and Geoffrey Rockwell, they developed this concept of the directory paradox, the paradox being uh, that uh, even if uh, everybody in the DH community prays for such tool directories, it's actually very, when, once they are uh, created, it's actually almost impossible to maintain them and to sustain them because um, it's, it, it has to be a collaborative setting and it's very difficult to, um, to, to actually realize them in, in, in such a setting. Um, so there are some, there were some kind of uh, discussion between the DIA communities and and um, and this uh, North American projects led by uh, Quinn Dombrowski and Geoffrey Rockwell. And you can see an example here of a forum that was held during the last uh, DH conference where we discussed this idea of sustainability of of discovery portals. And we don't uh, pretend at DARIA that we can solve uh, or overcome this paradox, uh, but we do think that uh, we are operating in a landscape or in a context uh, that is actually favorable for the sustainability of such, uh, of such service. And uh, already 10 years ago, uh, you find references uh, describing DARIA's role as a social marketplace for services, and this idea made its way um, to the strategic plan of DARIA that uh, Ergebet already mentioned this morning, that is covering the period 2019-2026, and in which this idea of a marketplace to facilitate fluid exchange of tools, services, data, and knowledge is actually one of the four pillars, one of the four strategic pillars. So, um, now we have the idea, we have the context, but we didn't find uh, the funding, uh, the money to realize it. So this is where the SHOC project uh, come into play. So SHOC stands for Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud. It's a Horizon 2020 project. Um, it's not only uh, to support the creation of the marketplace, it's uh, the, the scope of the whole project is uh, much broader than this. So it's basically, aiming among other things to create the social sciences and humanities part of what we have also heard this morning, the European Open Science Cloud. So you can see the, this European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC as a kind of a big framework or federation of different research infrastructures um, in which uh, different disciplinary clusters 
are uh, building uh, the infrastructural blocks for different research communities. And Shock is working to develop the social sciences and humanities part of this um, EOSC, alongside other projects as well. Um, so if you keep in mind that BSSH Open Marketplace is one of the services built up in this uh, Shock project, I think it's enough uh, for the moment. But if you have followed, we slightly pass from the DH context to the SSH one. So it's not only, more, um, not only anymore about digital humanities, but about social sciences and humanities. And um, it's actually not really a problem because when we have started to work on this uh, project, we actually realized that the, um, at the attempts from uh, no, the, the expectations from uh, social sciences communities and, and UMF, and humanities communities were quite complementary because social sciences, they have a lot of data, but not a lot of tools. And it's more or less the opposite for the humanities. So we thought that building up a discovery platform that could answer to both needs could actually be uh, possible. And in this SSH open marketplace, you can find uh, different uh, resource types. So we define five uh, categories of uh, resources that you can find in this portal, tools and services, training materials, workflows, data sets and, and publications. And we are building the whole portal uh, following three guiding principles, contextualization, curation and community. So contextualization, because we believe that if we don't uh, want to build just another catalog, it's actually worth it to create relations between items. So if you are looking for a, a tool, you can actually find very easily a training material that explain how to use this tool, maybe an exemplary data set, these kind of connections. Curation, because uh, we think that it's uh, um, thanks to a mix of automatic checks and manual curation that we will be able to guarantee the, the quality of the content um, in, the, in, the, in the catalog. And community, because we want a user-friendly interface to allow anyone interested to actually contribute. And you have here the link again of the beta version. I think it's on almost all the slides if you want to visit it. Um, so where are we at in this uh, creation of this, of this marketplace? So we are uh, working with um, an iterative process. So we had the alpha version back in 2020. We are now with the beta version and uh, we are working very hard uh, to deliver the final version at the end of this year. So in December 2021. And we are working hard to finalize the implementation. So I will start with the last um, pointer on the slide. Um, so the, the implementation we are working on now um, is the uh, login uh, with the federated authentication, uh, the curation component, so an editorial dashboard, the possibility for end users to have uh, edit forms to change the, the content of the, uh, of the records, the content of the marketplace. And we are also working towards sustainability, so to continue for this um, service to continue living after the project. So we, we, we are working toward community engagement, relying on existing uh, infrastructures and networks. Uh, and we believe that uh, because of this um, uh, development in the EOSC context, so in this European Open Science Cloud context, um, because this service is contributing to the discovery layer of this big federation that we can also um, manage to, um, to sustain the, this service uh, alongside other initiatives. Uh, and it's the result of a collaboration between, um, I already mentioned it, between different research infrastructures, so the sister infrastructures that uh, Pierre Mounier referred to this morning. So Clarin is in, CESDA, ESS, SHARE, and uh, OPERASON, and other uh, similar projects that uh, uh, Pierre mentioned this morning, TRIPLE as well. So here is a snapshot of the data population that we have because the, the workflow that we have for the ingestion of content in this portal is actually the following. So we have identified what we call trusted sources. We aggregate them, we aggregate the metadata for all the records in these different platforms and we aim at enriching then the records in the marketplace. Um, by a set of automatic uh, actions and uh, manual curation actions. 
So um, we, we have a first data population based on these different sources that you can see on the right side. And some of the automatic actions that we perform is, for example, that we identified, identify the tools mentioned in some publications. So it's interesting also as an echo of the presentation of this morning, because we decided at the beginning to focus on the H conference abstracts. So it's not publications per se, uh, they are abstracts, but it's actually where you can find this hermeneutical layer uh, more than in some classical publication. So it's interesting that it, it echoes of, um, of this morning. So based on this extraction of relation, we are uh, of um, tools from publication, we are able to create relations between the items in the marketplace. And then we automatize as, as much things as we can for the curation to only let a limited uh, set of enrichment for the manual uh, curator and all the contributors. But we really want to uh, allow this manual additions and, and enrichment. So I already mentioned it by a user-friendly interface. But we also believe that it's uh, only thanks to, or mostly thanks to um, little sessions or data tones or ends on session to accompany the, the contributors and researchers to um, and reach this platform that we will uh, manage to keep it in the long run. And to do this, we are also planning a set of incentives and rewards in the future uh, funding scheme of this, um, of this platform. So I don't know if I was too long or not, but I think that the next slide will be taken up by Ed. It does. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for introducing us to the SSH Open Marketplace. I'm coming to you guys today. Of course, I, as, as Laura mentioned, that I, I work with the SSH Open Marketplace, but I'm coming to you from my position as a historian, or really as a recovering historian. Um, I defended my dissertation a couple years ago, and I study early modern French history. Um, and I'm not here to talk to you about that today, but I'm here to talk to you about why you as historians should be interested in the SSH marketplace, but also digital humanities in general. There was this fantastic book that appeared uh, last year by Adam Krimble, Digital Technology and the Historian. And while I can recommend to all of you to read it, to sort of synthesize what he wants to say is that all historians and all researchers are profoundly affected by the changes brought about by digital technology. Of course, this manifests itself in the way that we do our research. Um, I think we, we can all think of the, the way of you know, archives being online instead of being important, but it also changes radically the way that archives and research libraries manage themselves. Uh, it also changes the way that we communicate. Here we are today, uh, have, we would, would have been in Lviv, but here we are all speaking online from all across the world. It has also profoundly affected the way that we teach. It's affected the way that we communicate our historical and, and scientific knowledge. So I don't think, you know, one of the things I want you to take from this is that digital is, is not something that is just sort of a byword for new, but digital really truly is just the, the new reality in which we live. Um, so it really should be thought of as, as something we, we, we have to accept. And I, I really think the best way to approach this is that digital should be another tool in your toolbox. Um, in much the same way that I may decide my way of reaching towards a historical conclusion is I'm going to use some sort of quantitative analysis of you know, records from the, the salt tax in France, this is, digital technology can be another way. It's just another way of trying to reach some sort of historical truth to the extent that we can say that there are historical truths. I certainly don't wanna open up that Pandora's box. Um, as, as well, I wanna emphasize that the SSH Open Marketplace isn't just for digital humanists, it's for all humanities scholars. So we have materials coming in that may have be considered more of a social sciences, but this is something that historians can use as well. Um, and vice versa, there are things that more historians classically would use or language analysis that linguists would use that can be very useful for us. So this is why we put the social sciences and humanities together, because by interacting in among them, we're, we're trying to study the same things, but we do them in different ways. Um, and to sort of bring this point across, I, I want to talk about a couple use cases. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems and Mapping, as well as handwritten text recognition. For anyone that studies anything from about before 1850, uh, handwriting can be a problem, but fortunately computers are there to help. Um, and then finally, I will go into talking more specifically how the SSH Open Marketplace works, um, because we put things into context, as Laura already mentioned. So putting the training materials and workflows into context with the tools, into context with the publications, really allows for the end user 
you to, to understand better what you're trying to accomplish. All right, Laura, could you go to the next slide, please? All right, so our first use case, use case is on GIS and mapping. So basically, we're trying to talk about cartographic data and how we can make our analysis easier or represent data via a visualization. So let's take a use case entirely at random. Nathan, he's studying princely voyages in the Holy Roman Empire in the early modern period, and he wants to represent this data to see what patterns of movement emerge. Do princes tend to move along certain ways? As well, how does confessionalization affect these movements? How does the, the, the profound changes in, with the development of the Protestant Reformation and Calvinism, how does this change the way that we move? Oh, three minutes, lovely. Um, so after hearing about the SSH open marketplace from a friend, he finds not only the tools that he needs that I've listed, but as well a lesson from the program historian that allows him to undertake his analysis. Next slide, please. So here again, we can see the slide. This is the digital, the hermeneutics to data to networks from the, the lesson. And we can see the way that it's presented. Next slide, please. Also, we can see that the, the person has researched uh, GQIS, which is one of the tools. He gets the link not of the GQIS, but he also gets four different lessons about how to use georeferencing and creating new vectors and such, as well as another tool that may be useful to him. Move on, please. And a second use case is transcribus um, and handwritten text recognition. Who has time to read documents like this? I certainly did when I was a doctoral student, but I wish I didn't have to. It was very painful. Um, so we can use the machine to let us help us. So please move to the next slide. Um, so what you can do is you can sort of have three cases with Transcribus and other sorts of HTR technology. On one hand, you can train the machine to read these paleographic materials. To do this, you will need a sufficiently large corpus of about 500 previously transcribed pages of the same or similar hand to train this model. That means that you're going to have to translate or transcribe at least 500 different images, 500 different pages. So you need to ask yourself before you sequence this endeavor, is it worth the effort? Um, this can be something that's more for a sort of long-term doctoral project or even a, a longer sort of finance research project. But no need. Um, maybe you just want to have a little bit of punctual help. Well, you can do this and use other models that are already published and already exists to read. I use this for the document that we saw on the previous page to use a document that was published by the ERH Day, which is a, a lab here in France. And it wasn't perfect, but it certainly helped me go through the process. And then even if you don't want to bother with doing any of these technical manipulations, you can simply use it as an interface to, for your own transcriptions. Uh, it beats the, the heck out of what I used to do, which was put the PDF on one side and the Word document on the other side. It's an interface that makes moving through much more easy and fun. Next slide, please. Um, so again, we want to talk about training and workflows because you may not have a, a lot of training in these and you may decide you want to do this, but I don't know how, to, you know, I, I don't have the training to do this. Well, fortunately, because we put the records into context, this is available. So the trainings and workflows, these are pedagogical resources that allow you to, to accomplish different tasks. And they're a key added value of the marketplace. So you can see here, we have a, a lesson on how to extract textual content from images. Next slide, please. So here you can see it. the workflow will give you steps. You will have the different steps you can take. And when you click and expand on one of the steps, you can see the expand button um, up top. When you expand, it will tell you what to do and will show you in context the related different tools that you can use. So it's a way to really sort of help you guide in this sort of serendipitous discovery of, of how to accomplish a task. Next slide, please. All right, and finally, what are the next steps? If you'd like to get involved, how can you do this? Well, and again, we will share the slides with you after, so you'll have the link to these slides, but you can come in as a tester. You can sign up to be a tester and report different issues on the beta version. As well, once this is fully published, you can become a contributor. That means you can be adding and enriching content. You can add tools that you know of. You can say, oh, I've used this tool, but the, you know, the description could be improved, or I wanna add these images. These are ways that you can add as a contributor. And this should be ready by December, 2021. And we hope maybe a little bit before. If you're really interested, you can become a moderator. So you can become me, a member of our editorial team. There'll be a call for interest that comes out in early 2022. This will give you an important position of making sure that the SSH marketplace is there. As, Mar as Laura talked about, these have to be there for, for collaborative purposes. And we need people to be involved from all over and all different types of contexts. So if this is something that speaks to you, please get in touch with us.
And then finally, you can simply be an ambassador, spread the word and the link to the marketplace around those around you in the same way that Nathan was able to find the GIS materials. Well, you can help other people figure out the research that they want to do as well. Next slide. And thank you so much for your attention. You have our contact information there and we would love to hear from you. Have an excellent day. Thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. Uh, as uh, we proceed with the previous session, we will have question and discussion in the end of our panel. Uh, and um, we are basically continuing uh, the topic of how digital technologies could help uh, a str uh, struggling historians to work with their sources, but uh, not only. Uh, the next presentation, uh, is uh, a semantic annotation of text and image uh, with uh, Recogito, the instrument uh, that probably many of us uh, used or uh, at least tried to use already. Um, and uh, our presenter is uh, Rainer Simon. Uh, he's a uh, senior uh, scientist and research uh, software engineer at the Data Science and uh, Artificial Intelligence Research Group at the Austrian Institute of Technologies. And um, beyond Recogito, uh, Rainer also uh, involved in uh, uh, several projects on uh, uh, use of uh, computational uh, approaches, uh, artificial intelligence, and uh, semantic technologies for uh, digital humanities and digital libraries. Uh, so, Arena, you have uh, 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, first, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to share a little bit about uh, my tool, Recogito. So I, I'm the main developer of the tool, uh, and I hope you can see my uh, screen now. So, uh, also thank you for the almost perfect introduction with the with the speech with the talk before. Uh, so, what I'm going to present today is a tool that is actually already listed on the SSH Open Marketplace. I just checked, um, and it also goes uh, to into the direction of one of the use cases that has been shown about mapping uh, a, a historical source on on a geographical map. So, this is exactly what Pelagios has been built for. Um, I will do most of the talk as a live demo, uh, but to give some context to those that have not used or seen the tool before, I also want to show a few slides just to give you the context. So what is Recogito? Uh, Recogito is a web-based annotation tool, which means you can create an account there, uh, you can upload texts and images, and you can create notes uh, and comments on the document. Um, so that's uh, functionality that you also have in other tools, of course. But where Recogito is a little bit different um, is in terms of, of this kind of semantic and geo annotation angle. So it was built with the purpose of um, allowing you to work with an unstructured source, a text or maybe a digitized uh, historic map, and then derive very easily in the, and in a user-friendly way uh, structured data either by geotagging the document and uh, enriching sort of the place references mentioned in the document or also by building networks between the actors in the document so if you have people if you have places and you might have relations uh, Recogito gives you a tool set for very easily marking up this kind of structured information in your historical source document uh, the roots of the tool are actually in the classics. So, and, and still today, I think most people who use it come from the classics and ancient history, people working with uh, literature from ancient Greece and Rome. So that's sort of the core bulk of the user base, but not only, and we hope to expand to other spheres as well. Uh, technically it's open source software, which means you can simply install it uh, free of charge for your own institution. However, we also run a public instance uh, if you don't want to install something or like technical space, uh, if you don't have server space available, you can simply go to this URL at the bottom of the slide, uh, https recogito.pelagios.org, sign up for an account and basically use the tool for free. Um, when I say we are hosting this, we, that's the Pelagios Network, that's an international humanities linked open data initiative, which came from uh, a couple of, of funded projects uh, funded through the, the Andrew Mellon Foundation. So we're very grateful for that. But that's not been the only source of funding. So we've received uh, funding also from other places, including Daria, by the way. So we're also very grateful for this kind of support. <laughs> right. Uh, and without further ado, I think I'm going to switch to the live demo. 
right. So you should see my browser now. This is what you see when you go to recogito.belagios.org. Uh, I'm going to log in with my own account. So as soon as you have logged in, uh, this is what you see. Uh, it's probably going to look like this. So that's the default view. So we call this space uh, the, uh, the workspace. Um, it's essentially like you have on Windows, your file explorer where you manage all your documents. Uh, you can sort them by different criteria. You can upload uh, new files uh, by clicking here, either by uploading an image or a text document, or also it supports TEI encoded uh, XML documents. You can create folders, uh, the usual thing. So for today's workshop, I prepared a little bit of sample material. So let's look at the text, for example. So once you uploaded the text, uh, you start with this kind of blank slate. So that's the reading view. Inside the reading view, um, you can simply create selections like you would expect in any other word processing tool on Google Docs or whatever. And as soon as you create a selection, the annotation editor pops up. First of all, it has conventional uh, functionality for creating comments, so a comment. You can also create tags. I will show later how people are using this. Click OK, and there's your first annotation. Everything in your annotation is always kind of stamped with your username and the time. Um, it is a collaborative system, so other people can also, or you can give other people access to your document, um, and they might write a reply. So you can have this kind of uh, mini discussion threads on every aspect of your text or image document. So that's the basic functionality, but what we're really interested in, of course, is the semantic annotation functionality. Um, as I said, the primary kind of use case was to do geotagging of the document. So let's just uh, select the place. Uh, and we have these kinds of three categorization buttons at the top, which you can use. You don't have to use them for an annotation. But let's say, so this is a place. So market is a place. And as you do that, the system automatically comes up with suggestions from gazetteers that are built into the platform. Uh, if you install your own system, you can have your own gazetteers. So it's you're not fixed to some gazetteers. Um, and it's also meant uh, to provide gazetteers that are specific to your domain of research. So I'm, I'm here using Pleiades, that's a gazetteer specifically for ancient Greece and Rome. So that's kind of the classic gazetteer. And since we're working with a document from that domain, uh, this is the, the gazetteer to use. Another thing that you can see is this kind of confirmation button here. It says confirm or change. So although the tool will provide you with automatic suggestions, uh, it will never kind of, uh, do anything automatically all by itself. So it will always ask for this kind of user confirmations. And as soon as I say as a user, yes, that's correct, only then it really gets sort of stored as a correct match. And even then uh, it's, it says, this is something that I said just now. So it's not an automatic match, but if, if this is wrong, you know who to blame. So let's just uh, tag a second place, Syracuse here, confirm again, click okay. And what happens here? Um, so the tool says you have 11 more references to Syracuse in that text. So the, the, the phrase appears uh, 11 more times. And it asks me whether I want to reapply this and I say yes, because this way I can speed up. And all the references to Syracuse in the text, if I scroll down below, are now also tagged with uh, the Gazetteer reference and with my name standpoint. Right, and as soon as we have that, we can uh, extract our map information. We can look at the text on, on the map. Uh, we can click on the button, uh, on, on the marker. Uh, it will show us the uh, text snippet. Also, you can see that this, but this, this marker here is a bit bigger because uh, it's actually 12 annotations, not just one, but all mapped to the same place. So this is the kind of basic functionality that you have. In addition, as I said, uh, and this is sort of more kind of uh, experimental, uh, it's, uh, annotating relationships. So let's say we have a person here. I want to mark this as a person. Unfortunately, we don't have the same, same kind of neat uh, lookup functionality. So we don't have a dictionary of people in the back end. Uh, that might be something for the future, very desirable. But at the moment, you can just mark it as a person and give it the type, but you can't really link it to a database. But I'll do it nonetheless. 
Um, so I think I'll skip this one this time. And then there's the relations feature. So relations is what I mentioned briefly before. Uh, this is what allows you to create kind of uh, relations between entities that you've tagged. So I select uh, a person, I select the place and we say, this person has traveled to this place. And this way you can very easily and quickly build up kind of maps from, top, from documents, but also networks from documents. Yeah, so that's basically everything to say about the text interface. Uh, some other aspects are you have statistics uh, about the document. So who's been active on the document? How many annotations are there? What kind of entities have people tagged and how often? What tags were used? So this is something uh, the recogito is used uh, a lot in teaching as well. So there are student assignments frequently in the system. And this is something that uh, a tutor could take a look at to see what the student progress is. Another thing, of course, which is important is export. Um, it's by all means not meant uh, that you should just work in the tool and the, your data is there and you will never get it out. The way it's meant is really that you would upload your texts, you create your annotations, you get your data out, and then you would work uh, in other platforms and environments. That's why Recogito has a whole series of export formats available. You can export uh, CSV, which simply is a spreadsheet of all your annotations and the tags that you've created. Uh, there is JSON-LD, sort of semantic web kind of markup, which uh, um, complies to something called the W3C web annotation model. So that's a kind of a web standard for, for annotations, which is also uh, semantic web compatible. If you're interested in the map, uh, there's GeoJSON, that's a format that would be compatible with uh, things like QGIS, for example, geographic information uh, environments. Other relations, you can export those uh, in different formats. Uh, compatible with Gephi, for example, which is a well-known uh, tool for, uh, for, for network analysis and, and it's open source too. Or the annotated documents, so you can get the TI document back. Uh, and more frequently, we also supply uh, IOB. That's a data format that you can use to create or to train your own machine learning uh, framework. So if you have an interest in training your own system for um, uh, recognizing uh, named entities uh, or other types of named entities that the standard named entity tools don't, don't cover, you could essentially use Recogito as a training environment. Another example, uh, another thing I want to show is, is here the sharing options. So uh, very important, when you upload a document to Recogito, you are the only one who will have access to it. So it's a closed sort of private space. Your workspace is only visible to you, but you can make a document public uh, if you want to. Um, you can also uh, provide different kind of sharing levels. So you can make it public so that everybody can view the document or you can make the document uh, itself closed, but the data would remain there. So maybe your text is under copyright, but you want to show the map. Uh, this is the setting you could use. So people could only see the map, but not the document. Or we call this the crowdsourcing mode. You could actually allow anyone to annotate the document. It would still require a, a, an account, so it's not anonymous, uh, but it's open to everybody who has an account in the system. Uh, if you don't want to make it public altogether, you can also invite different users in the system. So let's uh, invite my colleague Elton here. So this way, I might have switched off public access, but Elton would have read access, or I can give him writer admin access. All right. Um, very briefly, I also want to show the image annotation interface um, here back in the workshop. It looks the same, so I won't really go into much of a detail. Uh, it's supposed to work with high resolution images, so you can upload very big files and they be, will get automatically converted to this kind of zoomable uh, version. Let's switch to full, full screen. Otherwise, yeah, you can zoom, you can pan. You have these kinds of um, drawing tools, point or rectangle tool, or something which is called the tilted box, which is quite nice um, because with two clicks, you can create a box which can have an arbitrary angle, which is quite nice for, for maps, for example. And otherwise, uh, the, the tool looks the same. The editor just has an additional field for transcription if you want to use it. Um, 
And this is the way you work with image documents. Yeah, so we still have a few minutes time. So maybe I want to show some examples that other people have, have created with this, uh, maybe starting with, um, uh, yeah, with, with a map. Why not a map? That's actually a nice example. Oh, sorry. So this is an example that we created as one of our uh, research outputs from the projects that were funded by the Mellon Foundation. It's an atlas um, with different pages. Um, every page has been densely annotated by an expert from the British Library. Most of those, so every, every place name has been transcribed and most of them have been mapped as well, and not all of them. Um, so you can see uh, on the image that's, the, the, the atlas focuses on, on the coast. Uh, and what's also something I wanted to show is that you can have different kind of coloring options for the map. In this case, for example, we can use colors to differentiate between the different map pages. So you can easily see which kind of places are referred to on which map page, uh, on which atlas page. Uh, if you click on them, you will get the preview of the, uh, of the place name on the map. The white ones are also interesting because they denote uh, toponyms that appear on multiple atlas pages. So you can flip between them and can compare the different kind of, um, so you can compare the different uh, spellings and the different hands and so on. Right, um, yeah, I think I'm going to switch back uh, to the presentation because I think after all, I'm running out of time a little bit. Right, so that was, the basic tour uh, through the system, just to recap. So what would you want to do with it? Why would you want to use Recogito? Uh, so mapping of text and images is, is one key uh, purpose that it was built for, but I think it's more general, a nice online collaboration space when you want to work collaboratively on, on historical sources. It's used in teaching a lot uh, on the one hand uh, to teach kind of critical engagement with sources, because once you start collaboratively annotating, it really sort of raises questions. It uh, in, in, inspires discussions among students. So it's really kind of a close reading uh, that gets facilitated through annotation. And also, of course, uh, it's to build digital skills. So uh, people find it kind of an easy to use tool. So it's a very entry level teaching tool to convey digital skills to, to students of digital humanities, for example. Um, apart from that, uh, I think the best way to learn about Recogito is really to try it. There is also a small written tutorial at this URL here, so slash help slash tutorial. It's also linked from the start page, so if you have an interest, uh, you can read through that. Um, otherwise, really create an account, try it out. Uh, if you have questions, get in touch with us. So really, we're really interested in hearing uh, what people, what kind of ex experiences people have with it and what features they would want to have in the future. Right, and I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation and for perfect timing. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was very interesting, and you know, li listening to your talk, I was always remembering myself a few years back when I was struggling how to map my data, and uh, I wish you, I, I wish I know about your tool a few years ago, so it, my life would be much easier than. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for this very interesting presentation. And we are uh, moving on uh, to our last but not least presentation for this uh, session. Our next sp uh, speaker is uh, Marin Strobel. Uh, uh, Marin is working as a software engineer and uh, uh, part of the uh, Open Access, uh, Open Encyclopedia System team at the uh, Universität Berlin uh, and uh, uh, her talk uh, is Open Encyclopedia System, a framework for building and maintaining online uh, reference works. Uh, so, uh, Maren, the floor is yours. You have 20 minutes. Um, thank you very much for the introduction. I'm Maren Strobel. I'm hoping my mic works. You can hear me. Fine, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry for my rusty English. It's been a while, but I hope you bear with me if I stumble through the sentences to uh, present to you the digital tool that we developed uh, at the Freie Universität. And I'm now trying to share my content. And I hope you can see it now and move to presentation modus. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Perfect. So um, as mentioned before, I'm working for the Freie Universität Berlin and more specific, I'm working for the department which is called CEDIS, the Center of Digital Systems. And we support the use of digital tools throughout the university and uh, in uh, cooperations with other universities, we support the use of digital tools elsewhere. Um, digital tools include tools for e-learning, which was very popular in 2020 and 21. Um, we have tools for e-research and we have tools for e-publishing. We work together with the library, um, which is one reason why we noticed in recent years that there is a significant increase in working and publishing online uh, in general, but also specifically uh, in academic researches. Uh, and um, while trying to support projects that try to publish online, we noticed that there is a lack of software that meets the project specific needs. Uh, for all the different and diverse projects. And we started to develop our own solutions. And while um, developing a custom tailored software for the project 1914-1918, uh, the online encyclopedia of the First World War, um, the CEDIS developed a web-based and customizable and configurable <laughs> online um, software tool that can be used for different projects and we published it open source online. It is called the Open Encyclopedia System um, or short the OES and uh, because I'm German I'm going to pronounce it OES so um, yeah <laughs> the OES and um, I like to give you an overview about the software and uh, about the ideas behind OES some examples of projects that used OES and general information about OES. And yes, the, the basic idea behind Open Encyclopedia System, it's an open source platform. It's um, published under GPL2 license on GitHub and it's based on WordPress. So uh, if you don't know WordPress, that's a very popular open source software for content management online. And um, the main focus on, uh, of OAS is to build and maintain open access online encyclopedias or reference works. And uh, all of our projects are part of the humanities or the social sciences. Uh, the software is not limited to these fields, but that's uh, where we notice the most interest in publishing online. Um, the software is configurable, modular, reusable and extendable which uh, meets all the um, different needs of the different projects. And yeah, next slide. <laughs> Some more specific um, information about the ideas. Um, as I said, the main focus is to create and maintain an online encyclopedia. And most of our encyclopedias have some sort of citable article as their main object in, in the web presentation. And the articles include media and in, include metadata and links to other entities such as authority files. And some of our encyclopedias have um, a web presentation in different languages. Um, OES supports the collaborative work processes from uh, authors, publishers and reviewers. Uh, which we call the editorial team that uh, create and maintain the content of the website and uh, OS includes user and rights management so you can restrict um, work processes to specific user rights. Another idea of OS is to configure and manage editorial workflows. Uh, the most popular one is uh, version controlling for articles so WordPress has its own version controlling but we noticed that for academic purposes, we need a more specific and more citable version uh, of versioning. And uh, we, we implemented that for OES. Uh, we have some more complex workflows like uh, peer review processes that are available through OES. And uh, another aspect of OES is to enable community features. This is one aspect that will be uh, a, a focus for the next years, we will uh, enhance the functions and functionalities in that area. Um, we have some tools for uh, import and export of data that are created inside OAS. We do have RPs to authority files, 
um, like END database or Library of Congress. Um, and I can't see my slide, I'm sorry. Just need to move the grid. Okay wrong side. Um, anyway, <laughs> we try to interact with users uh, through crowdsourcing and um, yeah, commenting on pages like such. Um, next topic would be to give you some ideas about the examples. Oh, it's moving too fast now. Um, currently, we do have four applications that are online that use OES um, as their software to publish. Um, there will be two more by the end of the year and three more next years and we're growing and growing and hoping that there will be a nice OS community uh, throughout the next years. Um, and we do have an exemplary application which is called the demo, uh, the OS demo, which tries to showcase all the OS features and functionalities. And um, to start off, I uh, give you an example of um, an OS application and <clears throat> it's called Compendium Heroicum. Um, its subject is heroes and heroism and it's an online encyclopedia that includes article that are citable, that have metadata, that include authority file and uh, articles can be exported as PDF and are registered with DOI. Um, for the web presentation, so the user who visits the published website um, we do have index register, we have a full text search, and we have filter searches. Um, a lot of the features that were implemented for this specific project are part of the generalized OAS software because it's kind of our model uh, online encyclopedia, which guess, I guess has the most features that most projects need. Um, we have a more specific example. This is a biographical handbook. Um, the topic is casualties during the Cold War. And um, it has articles that include biographies um, with images. And we do have a uh, presentation in, in a map view where you can explore the data by moving around on the map. We do have faceted search and uh, a full text search as well. Um, another exemplar example is the online compendium uh, of German Greek uh, entanglements. This is the most complex application that we have uh, at the moment because it has multiple article types. It has um, like the standard compendium with articles that are citable, have metadata and authority files. But in addition to that, there is a knowledge base, which is a different kind of uh, article uh, that includes a lot of galleries and references. <clears throat> and we do have a bibliography um, that is connected to Zotero. Um, if you don't know Zotero, that's another online tool for managing research data and bibliographic entries. Um, for the online compendium, we implemented a complex search, which includes filters and um, <coughs> I'm sorry, mm, uh, filters and facets. And uh, most, uh, another specific thing about this application is that it uses two languages. So, <coughs> sorry, um, every page is available in Greek and German, and all articles are available in Greek and German. Just gonna try to get rid of the cough. <laughs> um, <coughs> another example that will be online next month is an online online project browser um, where you can browse through projects. And I'm sorry, I have to <coughs> half again. Um, um, the mm, Specific thing about this is that you can explore the data throughout a timeline. Um, we do have a faceted search as well. And um, especially for this project, we implemented um, more data import and export tools. Um, so the editorial team can work inside OES while administrating the project, but also off, uh, offline in form of um, Excel or CSV data. 
Um, then the demo application, our application that showcases all features and functionalities of the currently released open source code on GitHub. Um, we are currently working on the next release, which will be by the end of the year. Um, and it's supposed to be the base for all future projects. So the idea is that new projects take this exemplary um, online encyclopedia and modify it to their project specific needs uh, and especially modify the web page. So the color or the layout and the icons and then are ready to go and have an online encyclopedia that they can publish after filling it with content, of course. Mm. Right. Um, just to give you an overview about the architecture, this is quite technical, so I'm going to be very quick about it. Um, but as mentioned before, um, OES is a WordPress plugin, so it uses the WordPress structure, <coughs> which requires uh, a WordPress installation. Um, it uses the OES source as the WordPress plugin. It has a second plugin, which is the OES project plugin, which defines the data model used for a project and the project specific processing. And as is um, uh, the case for WordPress, it needs a front end. So it, it's a OS project theme, which is a generalized theme where you can modify the views and layouts for your specific project. Um, yeah, the components and an overview. So you do have as the base layer, the system component um, with a server which can uh, run the WordPress installation and the OS uh, plugin. You have a backend where you can modify specific data for your project, like the data model or the theme options with layout and icons and such. You do have a uh, front end administration layer, which we call the editorial layer, um, where editorial team can curate <coughs> and maintain the content for the web page. And we do have the front end, the web page where user can access the published content. And just to give you a peek uh, into how the editorial layer looks, if you have ever worked with WordPress, this will look very familiar to you. Um, WordPress has an area where you can um, create content. Um, this is an editor which has a lot of um, options. And since the introduction of the Gutenberg editor, it also has a lot of options for uh, visual effects like galleries or embedding videos. Uh, you can annotate, uh, you can set footnotes and stuff like this in the editor. Um, we do have a, a form at the bottom of, of the article where you can enter more data that will um, be presented as metadata at the web page. And uh, we can use the right side to add tags to the article. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, all right, this is just a peek view into the editorial layer. Um, then to give you an example of a data model, this is the data model of our exemplary um, application, the demo application, and um, it has an article in the heart of the data model, and an article can be linked to other objects inside the OS, which would be something like contributors, glossary entries, or indices for places or people. It can be linked to entities outside of OAS, like bibliographic entries in Zotero or different uh, online uh, bibliographic software. Uh, and it, of course, it can be linked to anything that is um, accessible through a link. Mm -hmm. We are working on more APIs right now. Um, next page, <laughs> this one. <clears throat> and to... Um, give you an overview about the future of OAS and the roadmap. Um, we are currently working on, on more APIs to connect the articles to more content outside of OAS, like um, GND, GeoNames, Library of Congress. And we want to extend the Zotero API <coughs> and to enhance some features that are currently 
in the OAS core, but are not yet perfect. Like um, the possibility to have two languages inside the editorial layer and two languages on the front end. Uh, we have some more features in planning. Um, they change a lot. They change um, through the uh, projects that we, we get. So um, with every project that we start, we have some more ideas for features that we need or we, we want in the OAS software. Uh, but one of the most important ones uh, will be that we want to extend the export formats. Uh, as for now, we export to CSV or JSON, but we want to ex uh, export to XML or RDF. Um, yeah, and I guess that's it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I need to drink a lot now. <laughs> I don't know what happened here. But uh, vielen Dank, thank you for listening to me. And uh, we are trying in the next years to build an OS community. We are still at the beginning of developing the OS software. And uh, yeah, we hope that maybe sometime or someday we will see each other in some context and work together on the OS software. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, great presentation, uh, Martin, and uh, to our all uh, presenters. And uh, so we are uh, very good with timing. So we have exactly uh, a planned half an hour uh, for discussion and uh, questions and comments. So uh, you can uh, write your uh, question here in the chat or just uh, make a s signal or like uh, raising hand to ask your question and uh, I would like to remind that we are working in two languages Ukrainian and English so don't uh, uh, it's not a problem if you ask a question in Ukrainian it will be translated to our speakers so um, I don't see uh, the oh yeah Taras, yeah, you can start. Yes, maybe I will start uh, with the questions and discussion. I actually, I, I had the pleasure to explore all three uh, projects that are presented in this session. Uh, so I'm a bit familiar with uh, all of them, and I really, I'm really happy that uh, we did have a chance to hear about them during this seminar. Um, mm, and uh, I have uh, sometimes maybe a bit specific questions, but sometimes maybe a broad, uh, more broader one it depends on, uh, on the project. So maybe I will start from the open marketplace as it was in the um, session um, uh, logic uh, that we had started with this. Uh, so uh, I was curious about the open marketplace, uh, which I find fantastic uh, resource to uh, uh, to find the materials and to find uh, different kind of services that are really helpful. And it is this is also something that you mentioned in the in the presentation that they are put in context. So they are always contextualized. And once you find some historical data set, then you can also find uh, a set of uh, tools or services, how you can work with this uh, data set and so on. So it's really, really important that you bring this context to, uh, to the end user. And I was uh, curious about another, uh, mm, another aspect, another context, let's say, uh, when it goes to the um geographical maybe cultural context because i can imagine that a specific request from a user in somewhere in lisboa would be a bit different than a request from a user somewhere in ukraine in Lviv, for example because of the uh, i don't know different context different disciplines if it's about historical data sets it would be different data sets probably and uh, um, so um, if we take the, it, this into account, we can see that uh, probably building such a service that can cover uh, so many different topics and so many different disciplines could be quite challenging. And I'm curious how you, in developing this service, how you consider this, uh, let's say, geographic aspect, a geographic context of uh, various needs and various requests that could come from uh, really different contexts. 
uh, and this this is the question uh, about open marketplace uh, another smaller question about uh, open marketplace but also another project because recogito was uh, we already found out that recogito is listed in the open marketplace and is present in that uh, service so i'm curious if uh, open encyclopedia system is already there as well uh, it would be uh, interesting to uh, to learn and uh, I also have a question regarding Recogito, and partly it was answered during the presentation, but this was something that I was uh, curious about before, uh, is uh, the possibility within the um, very great tool that is really uh, very useful. And as Alexei mentioned, uh, uh, it is really helpful. And there are so many students and scholars who um, really need this tool to work with. And I hope that this presentation will be another contribution towards uh, making this tool visible also for new newer, new audiences and new uh, places. Uh, uh, but also I was curious if it's possible, I mean, do you consider this as uh, something in your future plans within this tool uh, to have, uh, in addition to this possibility to visualize places on a map, uh, somehow uh, bring this possibility of visualizing uh, social networks, let's say. So if you have persons, possibility to tag person uh, if out of the text, it, would it be a possible uh, in the future, do you consider such a, a possibility to visualize networks of uh, personalities presented in those uh, sources and materials? And maybe the third question to the Open Encyclopedia, just to finish with my questions. Uh, uh, so the Open Encyclopedia is also another tool that uh, I'm a bit familiar with, and we actually try to uh, work with it in our pro digital projects at the center. And uh, um, actually, it was very helpful for us. And Maren Schrobel was also very helpful for us in order to uh, in installing this system for in our projects and working with it. Uh, here at the center. So I'm, uh, <clears throat> I wanted to ask uh, uh, more about uh, basically initial requirements or like what is basically needed uh, for a certain institution or individual project uh, in order to start using uh, this application in their own project. Uh, so what are those initial entry level for, for the uh, for the project to start working with this application. And also um, um, another question I was curious about uh, import export options, you mentioned partially, but I can also imagine the situation when I work with the Recogito tool and um, I'm doing annotations about uh, specific historical sources and then I export uh, the results of those annotations uh, into let's say CSV file. And uh, would it be possible the results of this annotation also to import into an open encyclopedia system in order to build uh, based on the, this historical source in order to build specific data model? Because the structure of annotation places, people, tags are more or less the simil uh, similar to the data model that uh, open encyclopedia offers. And in that situation would be possible to uh, import export data from the uh, Recogito tool in order to import it into uh, the open encyclopedia system. Okay, so probably this would be from my side. I'm sorry for taking too long, but hopefully- no, no, That's fine. Thank you for uh, this question. So uh, each of our project presented received a question comment from Tara. So let's uh, follow uh, the, the order we have in the program and uh, I'll uh, ask I, I would like to ask you to to, to, to try to be briefly uh, brief in your uh, responses uh, so uh, Edward uh, Lohr, uh, who would like to answer or maybe both of you yeah maybe it would be both of us um, um, but so what we are trying to do is in, in the in terms of uh, coverage of the different uh, so it's not only about um, geographical areas, but also um, multilingualism and uh, uh, somehow well, as well disciplines uh, representativeness in, in the marketplace. So what we've tried to do um, more on the technical side, let's say, 
is the, um, to allow the data model to support uh, different uh, content types and uh, coming from different uh, origins as well. So it means that we have different um, what we call dynamic properties in the data models that are help us, uh, they are basically metadata that are helping us to categorize the contents there. And we have, um, we can also rely on experiences from uh, research infrastructures in linguistics, such as Clarin for this uh, matter. So we are, for example, um, having a dynamic property that help us to cover the language, the languages that are supported by a processing tool, for example. Uh, <clears throat> but we are also have metadata fields that uh, help us to describe the languages of a tool itself. So if the interface of a software, for example, is translated in, in a different languages, but it's not the same if you take a data set, for example. So in, if a data set, you are interested by the language of the data themselves in the, in the, in the corpus somehow. So this, we have different uh, properties to cover this. And uh, as well, geographical availability, because if you take uh, services that are coming from, um, like if you take some of the services that we have imported as well in the marketplace, we also need to describe the geographical availability for some of the content. So these are a set of different uh, uh, metadata that we have, and maybe Ed will cover another aspect yeah, just really quickly here to mention sort of the other side, that's the technical side, but there's also sort of the curation and moderation side. And what we try to do is make sure that we have experts um, from all the different disciplines, as well as from different geographical areas, because different geographical areas have different traditions of how to approach things, different points of view. So we try as much as possible to get folks that, that have this diversity that come in to not only serve as contributors, but also to serve on the editorial board and to serve in on, on the administrative level. But of course, I mean, it, we can only take the volunteers that are there and, and it's complicated, but we, we're aware of this and we do our best. And I think fortunately with Dario, we have a, a fairly diverse um, background and of course Clarion as well. So we, we do what we can. Thank you. Um, Rainer, uh, would you answer the question raised? Yes, I have two questions. I can see uh, one uh, is about whether we are planning to visualize social networks in Recogito. So I guess the answer is uh, um, probably no, but uh, in a way, yes. So um, first of all, the networks, uh, I think the first prerequisite that you can do that is that you have this kind of backend where you link people and actors to a central registry so that you don't have 15, uh, 15 times the same name in the document, uh, but you have sort of a unique identifier and you can also link this to, to one person. So you have to build proper networks for the actors first. And that's definitely something that we are going to do. Uh, so that we can enable kind of building social networks in the same way as we're now building maps. For the visualization, I think uh, we're probably not going to be including this into the tool as a feature. Rather, I think we would like to see, uh, or maybe we would rather present a better documentation on how to take that social network data out of Recogito and use other tools to visualize them. So we're really looking into ways of transferring data into tools that are built for specific purposes rather than sort of wrapping every kind of feature into Recogito. So we're trying to delineate the functionality of Recogito before, I think. Uh, but another answer, I think, is that uh, the most kind of architectural changes that we had, uh, and, and we're, we're actually working on sort of a new, a major version of the tool now, which will sort of break the tool apart into separate components. So in a way, um, at the moment, it's kind of a monolith, and you can use the whole tool as it is, and if it's not a fit for you, you can't use it at all in a way, because take everything or take nothing of the tool. Uh, instead, we are now sort of re-engineering it to be more like a collection of small components that you can combine. It's like a Lego building plot of, of functionality. So essentially, the, the goal for the future would be that you take kind of parts from, from the Cogito, add them to your own website, for example, or to your own uh, collection management system or to your own virtual research environment. And using those kind of components, you would build Recogito-like functionality into your own system. And I think uh, in, in that sense, if, if you're working a lot uh, with, with network data or with, with, with 
documents that you want to use to study social networks, you might have uh, a document platform already or a document collection. You could add Recogito there as sort of a, a user interface. Uh, you would get the kind of export functionality for the annotations. And then maybe as, as a site uh, development in your own project, you would just need to take care of building the visualization yourself. So it's, it's sort of a bit vague, I'm, I'm aware of this, but the idea is more to break it apart into components that you can use individually and you can add your own components uh, yourself more easily. I hope this sort of answers the, the rough question. Okay, thank you. And, uh, oh yeah, sure. Question about uh, exporting annotations to the entertainment right. system. So that's, I think, is really an intriguing uh, kind of idea. Uh, I wasn't aware of open encyclopedia until today. So I would be very interested in exploring this further. Okay, thank you uh, for your answer. And uh, Marian? Um, yeah, um, same sentiment here. <laughs> I think um, the connection between OES and Recognito seems very interesting. I'm not sure how easy it will be, but it would be definitely possible, I guess, from, from OES view, need some implementation, but yeah, sounds like an interesting idea. Um, there was another question about the requirements for, for using OES. Um, to use the demo application as it is published now, you only need um, a working WordPress environment. So you need a server with a WordPress installation. Uh, but you usually need to modify the data model um, from from the OS demo because we we just pre uh, we just uh, offer the the data models like how an article looks, how a contributor looks, what we think is useful. But for most projects, you have to modify this. Um, we are working on a handbook how to do so. Uh, as at the moment, it's just um, very uh, unstructured and a little bit hands-on and you have to ask us how to do it. But by the end of this year, we, we hope we will publish a handbook with detailed information where you can modify the data model. And um, this will be just what you have to modify is a JSON file. That's a technical thing. And you just have to know what to write there. This is not very complicated. Um, the more, uh, so, so you probably need more time and a little bit of experience to modify the front end because your the web presentation usually is project specific because you want your logo, your layout and stuff like this. And you will have to know a little bit about WordPress themes. So a little bit of RTML and CSS and this kind of things. And you could use the demo theme but it's very generic. And like I said, it, it has the wrong logos. So this would be the thing that you would have to, um, to have a concept for the project and you have to uh, organize staff who can do that. And I think yeah. there was another question in the chat um, about the Zotero API. And um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but how it basically works is that the um, editorial team or everyone who is contributing to this publication is adding their bibliographic entries into Zotero. And uh, we are using a Zotero API to um, get all this information and to annotate this in the article. So it's the work would be inside Zotero and the connection to specific articles is inside OES. If that answers the question. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, I see that uh, our uh, participants is uh, us, uh, asking and answering uh, some questions in chat immediately. So we want to read it loud. And uh, uh, that's great that we can <laughs> work in, in, in a few way of communications parallelly I think it will be a good idea to save chat because ending this session because uh, there are already a lot of uh, great uh, links there. Uh, I don't see other questions in the chat so I would uh, ask a few questions from myself so uh, to the very practical one so first uh, is about uh, uh, first presentation uh, and uh, text uh, recognition technology or uh, so um, 
what I did, did not understand, maybe I have to work with a tool to, to get it, but uh, what is uh, your uh, policy and your options with uh, this multilingual documents with different languages because uh, usually when it's come to uh, uh, standard uh, text uh, uh, text recognition technologies uh, there are a lot of uh, problems with uh, um, with uh, recognition of uh, documents that is written in uh, different uh, two, three or more languages and uh, uh, sometimes uh, scholars have problem with that and uh, um, do you uh, work now mainly as far as I understand me with English, French uh, sources or you plan your system as open to any language that could be uh, proceed, I don't know, Slavic uh, or um, uh, 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 I don't know, some Asian languages, which is uh, totally different. How you see this future for, for the project? Uh, for uh, uh, Martin and uh, Rainer, I have, uh, it's maybe a question to all of participants, but it's uh, uh, mostly to two last presentations. Uh, so. Uh, you already discussed that there are a lot of features in your platforms that can be somehow linked or can uh, continue each other. Uh, and uh, uh, maybe here we can think about uh, some ways to link it, in not in terms of uh, mentioning the partner somewhere in the end of the web page where not, not so many users uh, will go, but uh, uh, maybe. Uh, you can provide also users with possibility to convert data or uh, with, without exporting them because it's problem with most of commercial services that uh, if you choose some software to work with your data, uh, sometimes it's very hard to switch to another software because you need to uh, use uh, another file formats, you need to format your databases and uh, maybe uh, Maybe you already thought of this. Maybe such links to, for example, uh, add uh, some things that already proceed, uh, proceed uh, uh, as a ma 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 map uh, to stories that you're trying to build on uh, Open Encyclopedia. Maybe some links is possible. How do you think? Yeah. So if I start with the multilingualism aspect of if we continue to discuss the multilingualism aspects of the of the marketplace. So we've started in the in the project uh, to develop uh, mainly the, um, the website in English. So also when we are doing this um, um, text extraction, like tool, ex tool mention extraction in the publication, we are speaking about English content here. But uh, what should be mentioned is the fact that um, our, so our initial idea was to reference um, content uh, that can be in, in other languages and to, to properly describe it with the appropriate set of metadata, but the main website uh, would remain uh, in English. But technically, we also have worked toward the possibility to support um, another interface for the, for the software. So, in, on the front end side of, of the website, we have uh, it's technically possible to translate the main um, uh, blocks, let's say, of the of the website in other languages. Um, and if we really want to, so it it will also depend how it develops. So this is what we've done during this last uh, uh, two years and a half of the of the project. And it, it will really depend also of the uptake of the of the service in, in the long term, because we can imagine that uh, if we have um, some communities that are more interested than other, we could also adapt and further develop the website to answer to their own needs. So I'm not sure if I completely address the, the question, but this is what I can tell at the moment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, Maren or uh, Rainer, there was a question about connection between the platforms. It's ju ju just, you know, wondering, it's not. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, I can start. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure I understood it correctly, but you mean uh, 
not rather not about the technical process of, of exporting different formats, but more of building awareness for people that there is the possibility to export to different tools. Is, is this more what you mean? Yeah, also awareness, uh, but uh, maybe also some direct link to, for example, not uh, be because no normally if I work with Recogito, I have to uh, export all my data and learn about open encyclopedia and uh, uh, maybe adapt my uh, files to uh, open encyclopedia uh, uh, needs and only then I can use another uh, another tool so uh, and with with many uh, tools it's even not possible to convert uh, the data so uh, uh, have you think about some common uh, not in not in, in this particular case, but generally uh, about some common formats or even direct ways to use data uh, I already have in my uh, uh, in my uh, room in Recogito at within other services. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I understand now. Yeah. So we are definitely looking a lot into into standard formats. So internally, everything is based on, on the W3C web annotation format, which is sort of the canonical standard format for annotations. But when you go to this export page in Recogito, you have options which are basically generated on the fly from those web annotations in different formats. And we are sort of looking into expanding those. So GeoJSON for the maps or, or the kind of Getty format for, for the social networks. It are just examples for that. So we are definitely interested in, in building and uh, adding to that whenever it makes sense. But I think your point is a really good one about more direct connections between tools. So we, uh, I think this is more about getting in touch with the people who build the tools and agreeing on, on kind of the linking because technically it's, it's there. So you can pull the data in different formats from our platform. Um, and we would love to, to talk to other people who have an interest in doing that. Uh, on the other direction, um, uh, where Recogito would pull data out of other systems, we actually have some examples of that. So there are connectors to, uh, to a repository at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science, for example. They run their own uh, text repository, which has an API. And we attach this directly, and uh, you can sort of pick it from the menu and just transfer a document across from their repository. Again, technically, that's not that difficult because they have a standard API, and we just basically download text. Um, so it's this is really, I think, it's more like a social process that we hope to uh, to, in, to to increase also in the future. So we are definitely more than happy to to work with other people around that. Thank you. Um, Maren, would you like to add something to? Um, I think I cannot add something. I think that's exactly what I would have said. Um, so I think this is a good idea to connect um, tools like this. I, I guess it's possible. The question is just and that needs to, to be developed between the tools. Um, if it's more work to have a uh, link between those tools or is it more work to um, do it? Uh, so. Um, for, for the editors, how much work is it to uh, cur curate the, the links between the tools? Sorry, it's a bit of confusing here right now, but uh, yeah, nothing to add. Maybe leave it like this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't see uh, other questions in the chat, but uh, I, I'm sure after your pr uh, presentations, uh, a lot of our participants are going to go and explore your platforms, which is uh, uh, more, more, uh, usually more beneficial to understand how it works and asking many questions uh, uh, but still it's great to have uh, you with us and uh, sharing with us how you actually design these uh, dec these platforms and how you make your decisions um, uh, thank you for uh, this great three presentation in at least in Europe it's uh, lunchtime so we are going to have a bit longer break now uh, 33 minutes exactly um, thank you very much for participants of this panel it was a pleasure and I really enjoyed uh, uh, all your presentations thank you
Yes, thank you, speakers, and thank you, Alexei, for moderating this session. Uh, we will meet in 31 minutes uh, back again. And uh, after what after this session, I'm really I'm sure that uh, there will be less uh, struggling students and doctoral students uh, after they uh, know now they knew about uh, now they know about open marketplace, recogit, and open encyclopedia system. It, it will definitely be helpful for them. And uh, I hope that uh, at the next session, we will also continue exploring new services and resources uh, that are also helpful to, uh, to our audience. Okay, so uh, 20, 31 minute uh, break, and then we are back for the third session. Thank you.
Okay, so we should probably start our third session of today's seminar. I can see that uh, all of the speakers for this uh, for this session are already present here. So maybe we can uh, move on. So the third session is about learning and mapping resources, platforms. Uh, we will continue uh, uh, our discussion from the um, specific cases and tools that we had in the previous session. Now we are moving uh, towards the next uh, uh next examples next cases uh, and in this session we will have presentations by nabil siddiqui jessica parr lean venard and uh, elena palko and alexicha batario i will be moderating this session uh, as we are uh, um, as we have it in our program uh, the first presentation will be about the pedagogical tool programming historian and this presentation will be by Nabil Siddiqui who is a, a, an assistant professor of digital media at Susquehanna University and his research focuses on the digital humanities, the history of computing uh, and information studies. Currently he's completing a book manuscript entitled Biting Out the Public, Personal Computers and the Private Sphere. And also, uh, this presentation will be uh, um, done by Jessica Parr, who is on the History and uh, Africana Studies faculty at Simons University in Boston, Massachusetts. Her research focuses on Black intellectual history in the early modern Atlantic world. Uh, okay, I, we, I can see that we have our speakers here. So, um, Nabil, the floor is yours. Okay, is there is there a way for Jessica to? Uh, okay, we got it going. <laughs> All right, thank thank you so much for having me here. Um, so as we, um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the programming historian, uh, but we've been around for about fourteen years in different forms, 14, 15 years in different forms. So I'm going to uh, just kind of overview a little bit about our um, platform, our um, journal, as we like to call it. Uh, kind of the reasonings for why we uh, do the things that we do. And then uh, I'll hand it off to Jessica, who will talk a little bit more about the journal, um, and then go ahead and also demonstrate uh, our website so that um, to familiarize yourself with how it, um, it functions, um, and some of the things that we offer on there. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so uh, I wanted to begin with just a little bit of the history of uh, of our uh, of the programming historian. Now, this uh, originally began out of um, the uh, a project uh, in Canada called the Canadian History and Environment Digital Infrastructure Project, or it was um, awarded a um, uh, some funding from uh, that uh, organization. Uh, and it was originally founded by William Turkle and Alec uh, McEachern um, in 2007 and 2008. And what they noticed is that there was a deep need for developing programming skills, uh, both for humanities scholars and for humanities students. Um, and so they developed a kind of a worksheet, not a, sorry, not a worksheet, a sort of a small um, uh, book uh, pamphlet, if you will, on different uh, uh, on ways of programming in Python uh, that would be geared specifically um, towards humanity scholars. So what they, uh, that, that was uh, released in 2007, um, 2008. And ever since then, the project has grown into a website. Um, that website was launched in 2012 with an independent editorial board. Um, we are now administered as an umbrella organization by uh, a UK charity. And we've expanded our offerings of not to not just Python, uh, but a variety of different languages. So we have uh, tutorials basically on, um, we have tutorials on things as diverse as machine learning, um, we have tutorials on just uh, how to set up uh, Omega, uh, sorry, uh, how to set up websites. Uh, we have tutorials on R, 
uh, and statistical languages. And so we've really expanded um, our offerings uh, to be a place where uh, many people can gain the skills necessary for digital humanities um, in one place. We've, we've gotten a lot of people over the years that have uh, used our platform for um, that is that have used our platform uh, in their classroom. Uh, we have uh, right now we ADHO, the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization is running a book series or what they're calling a book series where they go through uh, some of the lessons. So we've been used as a pedagogical tool uh, for a while. In fact, my own doctoral work, uh, one of my classes, I used the tool uh, before I was a part of the project. Um, and so it, it is something that we, we try to emphasize its pedagogical ability. Okay, next slide. So we uh, are kind of in a unique circumstance. We're both an academic journal um, and we're also a open access pedagogical resource. Uh, we're a variety of communities. And what we use for our um, service is GitHub. And that's a very particular choice that we've made. Um, to my knowledge, we're the only humanities uh, journal that uses GitHub in the way that we do. Uh, so all of our uh, peer review is done in open peer review, which comes with its own challenges. There's a lot of research, uh, which we, uh, you know, I can talk about uh, during the Q&A session, but there's a lot of research about uh, certain groups that might have difficulty uh, or engaging in open peer review or have um, you know, negative, more negative experience than others. Uh, but we want to make this open peer review. So everything we have uh, is available. If you go on our GitHub, you'll see uh, that you can view the current uh, tutorials uh, that are being uh, discussed right now. You can contribute to those if you would like uh, by just kind of uh, responding to one of the issues. So each issue on our GitHub page uh, represents a, a tutorial um, that's either in, uh, that's, that's being, uh, put up for review or has some sort of other issues. Like we sometimes retire tutorials, uh, so on and so forth. We're also open access in terms of our website. So our website runs on Jekyll, uh, which is a static site, uh, generator. Uh, and you can actually see us make both the technical contributions, uh, for the programming historian website. Uh, you can fork that if you would like. And you can, again, also see the ways in which we uh, conduct our peer review process and all, all the other guidelines for how we um, implement our editorial board, how we, uh, you know, our onboarding process, everything is open. Um, so you can see basically the full workings of the program historian, both as an organization, uh, as a journal, and as a website at, at any point that you want. Um, all our acts, all our, um, uh, <clears throat> sorry, all of our um, tutorials are, or the Programming Historian is a gold open access publication, and all of our lessons are published with Creative Commons. Um, so we have, uh, as we'll get to, uh, we've expanded our language offerings, um, but we've also had people remix our uh, tutorials or translate them themselves. So we have a Japanese version, which I think uh, Jessica might briefly show uh, later on that was created due to these the, the kind of uh, freedom we try to provide um, other scholars and other people in the digital humanities community um, uh, to use our, um, use our materials. Uh, next slide. All right, so one of the things that uh, we've recently taken, not recently, but have really amped up quite a lot um, is our language offerings. So right now, uh, our editorial team is consist of not only our English editors, uh, which I'm a part of, um, but we also have editors in a variety of different languages. So we um, have been developing a larger global uh, platform in terms of getting people to come to our site. Um, right now, we have three major language uh, teams. We developed a Spanish team in 2016. 
Uh, we've developed a friend, we, we uh, created a French team or uh, took on a French team in 2019. And in 2021, we uh, implemented a Portuguese team. So we are, uh, all our tutorials are, um, we attempt to translate them to the best of our ability using our teams, but there's a lot of work involved in that. Um, there's a significant amount of difficulty in uh, making sure that certain things that are uh, English only um, are translated then to other uh, places around the world. Um, a lot of that has to do with not just um, the uh, the, the text of our tutorials, but also the interface of many of the programs and softwares that uh, we that the those tutorials rely on. Um, so this is one of um, I, I think the only real resource I know in the digital humanities that tries to make such a large emphasis on making sure that our global uh, presence is taken seriously. Um, and the fact that we are trying to translate these lessons brings a whole uh, mess of complicated but interesting um, discussions about the nature of language um, and that I think it is oftentimes uh, underneath these uh, structures uh, when you just see the website and stuff like that. It might seem like we're just translating um, you know, word for word or something like that. But in fact, we have a whole uh, process in which we try to facilitate that and a whole process in which we um, uh, think seriously about those issues. Okay, uh, the next slide. So this will be the last slide that I'll talk about and then I'll hand it over to Jessica. Um, this is just a little bit about our community of contributors uh, and our community more broadly. Most of our authors are relatively new to the academy. That's been changing quite significantly. Now we get uh, quite uh, people that are much more higher on in their career. And we use a lot of the authors, including myself, uh, when I um, when I uh, contributed uh, lessons to the programming historian, use it as a way to master things um, in through their teaching. Um, so they develop these skills and oftentimes they want to share that in some way, but these skills take a large amount of time to develop. So for example, uh, machine learning is something that uh, I'm getting much more involved in and it takes a long time to learn the mathematics behind it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, you know, we, a lot of times the, um, the labor of just kind of uh, learning that skill, being able to explain it to somebody is not something that's available on academic CVs. And so a lot of our authors use it as a way to kind of demonstrate that. And they put us in our uh, CVs in a variety of ways, but we try to kind of emphasize that we are a journal, uh, we are um, peer reviewed, and that you uh, get kind of uh, credit in terms of academic credit, if that's sort of your background. Uh, for contributing to that. In the past, we've solicited various lessons. Uh, we actually have a, a solicitation right now um, for people that will use um, uh, certain archives out of the, uh, out of the United Kingdom. And, and so um, you can see that on our site and when we demonstrate it maybe, uh, but most writers have come to us uh, in the past. Uh, we have gotten so many lessons over the years now that we rarely solicit lessons unless there's some major need. Um, what we find is that we don't actually, we still don't have a lot of search engine or Google Scholar results. Um, so our articles are still not seen by a lot of audiences as journal articles, but we're hoping to change that and kind of take seriously the, the, the labor, both mental and uh, the, the kind of mental and uh, intellectual labor that's involved in bringing these um, uh, bringing these lessons to a broader audience and, and for kind of developing that expertise. Okay, so I will hand it off now to Jessica. Uh, I know that we only have a few minutes, so I want to uh, give her as much time as possible. Jessica, are you there? Yep. Sorry, I was having trouble with unmuting. Oh, um, okay. Oh, uh, view. Okay. 
So I'm going to go back. So um, as Neville uh, indicated, we are attempting to be a global DH community. Um, I just wanted to show a quick map of where our current team members are. Um, we, there, we have key teams in Spanish, English, Portuguese, and French, along with members of the editorial board and um, myself, I work as the global team lead, so working to facilitate global uh, outreach as well as uh, collaboration across the world. Um, and you can kind of see where our teams are coming from, um, quite a number of different countries. This is done deliberately because we know that even in large language groups like Spanish or French, you know, French speakers don't necessarily share all of the same colloquialisms as Quebecois, Mexican speakers of Spanish don't necessarily have the same cultural um, sociolinguistic translations as Spanish, um, Portugal, Portuguese um, in Portugal is different than Brazilian Portuguese as well. Um, so we try when we look at global language groups to accommodate these differences. Um, as Nabil said, we have quite a bit of traffic and you'll notice here um, on Twitter, Sophia, who is a member of our French team, who is tweeting about um, our French, um, our new French uh, language team. This was just about a year before the French team officially joined us. We had reached out because we want, specifically wanted to recruit a French language team. Um, you can see here, um, uh, just quickly, again, I have the list of our language teams and we have about seven or eight scholars from around the globe um, from different countries in each group. Um, one of the things that we have done is to try to facilitate workshops. Um, this was done by Marie's Jose Ifendor, who is based at Universidad de los Andes in Colombia, and our colleague Adam Crimble, who is at the University College of London. Um, they did, they worked together to get some funding to help support a workshop to bring in speaker, Spanish speakers from Latin and South America, um, both to build up their digital humanities skills with the ultimate goal of writing DH tutorials in Spanish rather than translating from English. So we're trying to have tutorials that are written originally in the target language and that are just not translated. And one of the things that we've been also working on is trying to get um, more folks who can translate those uh, tutorials that originate in Portuguese or French or Spanish back into English. Um, but of course, not everything is suitable for translation. Um, we have here, I'll try to move our tiles out of the way here, a list of where our top traffic is coming from. We have a large percentage of people coming from the United States, but big groups of scholars visiting us from India, Spain, the United Kingdom, Mexico. Um, these are our top 10. Um, and Nabil had mentioned that because we work on a Creative Commons license, other scholarly teams can come in and use our content to create their own output. Um, this is at Kensai University in Japan. Um, a group of Japanese scholars have put together a Japanese language programming historian. Um, they're actually independent from us, but they're building on our, our work. And we actually welcome this sort of work because it helps to disseminate um, different skills to other parts of the DH community around the globe. Um, one of our challenges as a volunteer team is because is that because we just don't always have the bus factor or the technology, the, um, the, the number of people required to be able to produce language and dis, uh, language editions in every language that um, everybody would hope to see. 
Um, I'm just going to now quickly show you the website because I know we are running low on time. Um, this is the opening page to our website at programminghistorian.org. Um, you can see here, this is the initial English language. We uh, edition, we have 85 lessons. Um, each edition has its own ISSN number. Um, this is entering the, the Spanish edition. We have 52 lessons. Um, this is the French edition. We currently have 18 lessons. And then this is our brand new Portuguese lesson um, where Portuguese translation, we have 12 lessons. Um, we work together to translate not only the lessons themselves, but to all of the background, all of the content before we launch a team. So we have an entire copy of our website in Portuguese before we even start to launch our Portuguese lessons. Um, you can see up here, um, we have a list of the lessons um, and there is an index by the type of skill that you want to learn. Um, I'll show you here this lesson that's at the top. Um, you can see that it's peer reviewed, um, who the editor who worked with the author was, who were the reviewers, because we try to be as transparent as possible, as well as capturing the metadata on publication dates, modification, and then we rank them for, two, for the uh, tutorials for difficulty. Uh, we try to have a lot of uh, beginner friendly because we are a, uh, a resource that attracts a lot of folks that are new to DH or early in their careers. Um, but we also do have some like this that are either medium level for some folks who have some decent technical skills to begin with or are DH scholars who are looking to expand their skills all the way up to the more advanced level stuff. Um, and you can see here that we have a DOI number for each of our tutorials. And this is designed so that our, um, our authors can try to get credit at their home institutions to, for their publication. Um, we have all of our documentation here. You can see an overview um, where you can report a bug. We have the reviewer guidelines. So we usually, the individual editors reach out, but if anybody is interested in serving as a reviewer, they're free to contact us and let us know and we'll put you on our list of people that we review um, for us. Um, we have our author guidelines here. Um, what are the lessons? What are we looking for? How do you propose a new lesson? Um, what the process, the editorial process is. Um, as Nabil indicated, we require everything to be open source, including um, all of our tools because we don't want people to be shut out of using us because they can't afford a particular software. Uh, we have translating guidelines here. Um, and these are things that we are always editing and updating um, because, of course, as we grow and we invite new language teams and new cultural input, um, we recognize that there may be new things that need to be addressed. So you hear proposing the translation. So if there's something that somebody wants to translate, um, how we want to see the writing and formatting of a lesson and then how to submit a translated lessons. And the translations themselves are reviewed for accuracy as well as for cultural um, fluidity, cultural, um, cultural fluidity. Um, there's editor guidelines as well, technical contributions. Um, this shows our how to report bugs. This is talking about if you're editing on our GitHub, um, you can see some examples. I'm not going to take the time to jump to our GitHub now because we're running short on time, um, but you can kind of get a sense of how our GitHub works and how we use to uh, communicate asynchronously um, across all the contributors um, and how the process begins. 
and then how to create new branches and so on and so forth. Um, GitHub is one of those polarizing resources. Some people swear by it, other people just swear at it. Um, it's sometimes a little bit of a learning curve, um, but we've just not found anything that works quite as well for our purposes. So for now, uh, GitHub has been our resource. Um, and I think that's pretty much it because I don't want to run over our time, but we're happy to answer questions. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Nabil. Uh, the same as in previous sessions, we leave questions and comments for the session after the, all three presentations. So uh, there will be a time for that. In the meantime, I encourage everyone from the audience and the participants to leave their comments and questions in the chat uh, uh, for the discussion session of the uh, third presentation. And now we're moving on to the next presentation about digital resource for teaching Holocaust history in Ukraine. It will be presented by Lean Venard, who is a senior user experience designer and researcher at uh, the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. Uh, Lean conducts research with teachers, students, policymakers, and amateur historians to learn how they interact read, learn from, and use the museum's digital history platforms. She uses these insights to ensure that the museum's online resources are easy to understand and meet audience needs. Uh, so, Lean, the floor is yours. 20 minutes to presentation. Great. Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. So yes, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. I'm Lynn from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. And we are working on a new digital resource for teaching Holocaust history in Ukraine. So I wanna tell you a little bit about our project and how we are working to inform our tool through collaborative research and what that means, like what our collaborative research process is. And what we learned from talking to um, students and professors throughout this process, and then how we've adapted that to our website and what we're doing with that. So we'll give you a preview of some of the um, main screens of the site. So first of all, what is this project? So we are working collaboratively to create a Ukrainian language website to be used by professors and students about the Jewish and Holocaust history of Ukraine. So um, it's important for us to emphasize this is a collaborative creation. And so we're doing participatory workshops with students and professors in Ukraine to determine our project direction, to get insight about what content we should be including on this website and what sorts of multimedia features would be most important to include. And then we also um, are working with professors to help provide guidance for them, for professors in Ukraine who want to integrate this Holocaust and Jewish history into their coursework. So you can see a preview here on the right, and I'll be talking through that um, as we go on. So what can we learn from collaborative research? Um, so for us at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, it was really important to work directly with Ukrainian students and professors to learn what they are currently doing to learn and teach the Holocaust and Jewish history, and what do they need, what is lacking from their current resources or the way they have been teaching this material currently. And then how can we work together to create this resource in a collaborative way? And then from an internal perspective, what do we need to build it? What resources do we need to outsource? What do we have in-house? And how can we ensure that the site content and the technology is maintained over the long term? I think all of us who work on digital history projects, you know that you don't want to just put a site out there and have it exist and then never think about it again. It needs to be maintained from a technical standpoint, but also it's important to maintain the content and make sure it's up to date, that we're adding new resources so that it's a growing, um, it's a growing site. 
So when we started our collaborative research process, this was back in February of 2020, we came, the team from the museum came to Kiev and held a full day workshop with five students and whoops, 15 professors from across Ukraine and museum educators as well. And we did some interviews with the students to sort of get their insights and also taught, had, had two focus groups with professors. So um, it was important to learn from them to understand their needs and challenges from a technology standpoint in the classroom, how they're using technology in the classroom, how they might want to use a website in the classroom, and then also their needs and challenges around teaching Holocaust history in Ukraine and what they might need from a resource. So we also did a design workshop, which was a lot of fun and it helped people to brainstorm and try to creatively think about, you know, if we were to create a web resource for, um, with professors and students in Ukraine, what would that look like? How can we get students excited to learn about Jewish history of Ukraine? Um, and how can we help professors integrate this material into their existing courses or create new courses? So the design workshop was great to get our brains thinking about how can we solve some of these challenges that had come up in the earlier focus groups. So then we conducted also after the workshops, some online surveys, which is another strategy for us for um, collaborative research and learning from Ukrainian professors and students. So we had two online surveys and we use them to really talk to a more general audience. You know, if you're talking to history professors only, you might get a different viewpoint. And so we wanted to think about the insights we gained from that workshop and see if we can ask some, you know, more of a general public audience about those insights to see if we can learn anything more. So um, we also wanted to learn a bit more about technology use in Ukraine, just to make sure that we we're creating a platform that was usable. And um, if there were going to be any issues, we could work to solve them. And so the tools we used for um, this was SurveyMonkey and Usability Hub. And why I like these particular tools is that you can use them also to recruit participants. So um, if we had just used our museum list of people, then we would already be sort of biasing our results and that we would only be talking to people who already are interested in Holocaust history or already know a bit about it. So it was important to use these tools to help us recruit people so we got a more general audience. And then the third um, research, collaborative research process we used was virtual research sessions. So obviously, because of COVID, we couldn't go back to Ukraine to hold more workshops in person. So we were lucky enough to find um, our Ukrainian participatory researcher, Dasha, who was super great to work with. And we conducted three sets of virtual one-on-one -on -one participatory research sessions in Ukrainian with 23 students and 11 professors from across Ukraine. So we did this in three groups or three sort of scheduling groups so that we can pivot our research as we went. Because in the beginning, maybe we had some more broad questions. And then as we got to the third round of research, we wanted to really get into like the details of like specifically, what do you need? Like exactly, you know, what types of articles and all of that, like getting really into the nitty gritty. And so one tool we used for these virtual research, research sessions, which was really cool, is Miro. So Miro is like a virtual whiteboarding program and it's online. So it's easy to, for everyone to access. And so it's sort of like, you can put anything in there, whether it's screenshots, visuals, videos, um, sticky notes, participants can use sticky notes and add dots to things. So in this particular um, session, or this particular image that you see here, we were talking to the students and professors about which regions of Ukraine should we highlight the most or which should we 
emphasize or what particular things should we talk about when we're talking about different regions of Ukraine. So that was really helpful. Using Miro was sort of a way for participants to be more active and to open up a little bit more versus if it's just a one-on-one -on -one interview the whole time, then it's just not quite as um, collaborative. So that was really a helpful tool. So what did we learn for we had these three types of collaborative research and we learned a lot over the course of the last year. Um, and so one thing that was really important that we learned fairly early on was that there's a gap in resources and knowledge about Holocaust and Jewish history in Ukraine, but students are interested. So that is really exciting to hear that the students do have this interest. Um, you know, this one student in this quote said that they wanna learn more about Jewish history in the Oblast where they live, and they wanna research why there's so little information about Jewish people. And, you know, another student said that we don't have a tool like this in Ukrainian. So it's great to know that there is a gap that if we create this resource, it's something that doesn't exist already and that we can try to fill that need. And something else that came up a lot was that personal stories are captivating for students and really seen as unusual or unfamiliar. Um, so some students said, I wanna keep reading these stories and you know that they were worried for the person in the story. And so what the museum does is we have a lot of artifacts and whatnot in our collections. So photos, objects, um, videos, whether it's oral history, testimony or a historical film footage. And so using these artifacts to tell this person's story of what they experienced during the Holocaust. And it was interesting to learn from Ukrainian professors and students about this because in our other research with different audiences, personal stories are always often very intriguing for people. So we wanted to see if um, professors and students in Ukraine also felt that way. So it was, it was a, a great insight. And then something else we learned a lot from students talking to them in these collaborative um, research sessions was that multimedia content is really important, that um, students will read articles and whatnot, but they really, really want that multimedia content, videos, photos, um, audio even, to, to really bring things to life. Um, you know, the student said that these films are so interesting because you really get the feel, full feel for what it was like during this time. Um, and then some students were surprised. They didn't even know that videos like this existed. So it's important to sort of meet students where they are. They're wanting multimedia content. They want things that are not just long articles with no photos or anything in them. So to help keep their interest to have this multimedia content. And then something that also came up a lot during these collaborative sessions was that regional Ukrainian content is wanted by both students and professors, and that people were most interested in learning about their own region, um, whether that's where they live now or where they grew up, where their family is, but that some of the students who had Jewish friends, then they had already learned about the region, the hi Jewish history of their region, but they were curious then to know about other regions of Ukraine, what happened there. So in one of our, our last sessions, group of sessions with students and professors, we wanted to get their thoughts and insights about, okay, we know um, we had heard that, you know, you want a certain amount of articles of that just tell the background of the Holocaust and what happened. And then you want a certain amount of articles that um, are specifically about historical events in Ukraine. And then, you know, people wanted personal stories. They said you can never have enough personal stories. So, and all of those multimedia. But what does that mean for the project team? Like how many things do we need to create? How do we prioritize all of these things? So we wanted to ask the students and professors themselves how, if you had a hundred pieces of content, how would you divide this up? 
Um, so it was really useful to take those more anecdotal insights of, yes, I really want multimedia content on Yes, I love personal stories too. Okay, what does that really mean? Like, what should we put on our to-do list of content to build? So this was really important part of the collaborative process to hear directly from students and professors of what types of content and how much. So based on all of this research, um, this is what um, we will work are working on and building. So the website will have all content in Ukrainian. We'll have background articles about key concepts of the Holocaust so that professors can teach, you know, give an overview of that content so that you have the context that you can provide for the personal stories and whatnot. And then also articles about the Holocaust in Ukraine and how different regions were different, different things happened in different places. And a regional landing page so that people can have easy access if they want to view content just about the region where they live, then they can go right there and explore and browse around on their own. And as, as I said, personal stories about experiences in each region of Ukraine and multimedia resources, film, audio, and photos from our collection. And also for professors, we heard that, you know, they really loved the idea of this resource, but they wanted a little bit of guidance of discussion questions or some sample lesson plans to pull from to adapt for their courses. So this will be the landing page for this content. Um, we will have personal stories, regional quick links to the regional landing page, teaching resources, and then a whole um, bunch of quick links to featured um, key resources. And here are two examples of personal stories that we had um, used in the collaborative sessions to get feedback and people really really um, re it's really resonated with people. So the one on the left is a shorter version of just about this one man who lived in Ukraine and his story using a historical photo from our collection. And then on the right, this article actually was resonated the most with people that people were really intrigued by this article. And it uses artifacts from the collection. It's a bit longer and it tells the story of this girl who wore this green sweater and what happened to her and her family during this time. And then there's other, further down the article, there's other um, photos and artifacts that people can explore about this girl and her family. And then we will have a regional landing page for Ukraine. This was something that was really important that we talked about with students and professors to identify what would those regions be um, if you were to divide Ukraine into regions, how would you do that? And what would you talk about in each region? Which cities and towns and villages um, would you expect to see? So we'll be highlighting these four regions and having quick links to tags about places and themes in each region. And then this would be finally the teaching resources page. So this will have, um, quick links to everything that a professor would want if they wanna use this site in their courses. So we have um, some of the key background articles, we have links to those lesson plans, and we have links to articles that have discussion questions, which was really important for professors that we talked to so that they can just go here right away if they're thinking about using this resource, figure out how they might wanna integrate this material into their coursework and, um, yeah, so right now the website is live at encyclopedia.ushmm.org slash UK. Currently, um, it's primarily background content about the Holocaust in Ukrainian. So like introduction to the Holocaust um, and some, some key articles. There's about, I think, um, there's over 10 articles on there now, but they're primarily those background articles. So through August, 2022, we'll be building new Ukraine focused resources that will be telling those personal stories in the multimedia and, um, and have those teacher resources. So you can look for that at, um, in next summer. So thank you. Great. Uh, thank you, Ian. Um, thank you for the timing. Uh, 
Now we are moving on to the third presentation uh, about the historical mapping platform Shadows of Empires, which will be presented by Lena Palko and Alexei Chubotaryov. Lena Palko is Lever Hulme Early Career, Career Fellow at Birberg University of London and Research Associate at the Con uh, Center for Governance and Culture in Europe at uh, the University of St. Gallen. She was awarded her PhD from the University of East Ang Ang Anglia in 2017, and she has recently published a book, uh, Making Ukraine Soviet, Literature and Cultural uh, Politics Under Lenin and Stalin. Her current research examines the interwar minority policies in uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And Alexei Chabotario, whom you already know from the previous session uh, where he was a moderator, is a research associate at the Center for Governance and Culture in Europe uh, at the University of St. Gallen. He's also involved in the projects of uh, the Digital Forum uh, of the European Association of Jewish Studies and the Center for Urban History of East Central Europe. His research interests uh, include migration and Jewish history, borderland studies and environmental history of East Central Europe. Recently, he began a research project on Zbruch as a water river. So, Olena and Alexei, uh, the floor is yours. 20 minutes for the presentation. Thank you uh, for this introduction. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, I will start. Uh, uh, our presentation with a uh, short overview of uh, our project and uh, Olena will continue with uh, more uh, practical example from our web page how a uh, user can navigate uh, there and which uh, uh, features we are offering at the uh, platform. So uh, the historical digital mapping platform uh, Shadows of uh, Empires um, was created uh, this year and uh, many parts of this platform is still work in progress. So we started uh, uh, this uh, website uh, last uh, winter and uh, this year we are working mostly with uh, East, uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Southeastern Europe. Uh, and um, now we, we are planning to continue this work uh, and probably in one year uh, we would like to have most of Europe covered uh, with uh, map uh, profiles for each country. Uh, so our idea was that uh, there are many uh, media content from which you can uh, learn how borders, general borders uh, changed in Europe. There are many content in the internet that show you these changes over time. Um, of course, there is a question of accuracy and of uh, 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 how, how, how exactly these maps are uh, done. But uh, for us, the uh, biggest uh, question was what else could be done in this direction, how we could not just show changes over time or uh, show Im images uh, of historical map, but uh, work with them, how we can compare them and how uh, we can uh, uh, explore maps uh, from uh, combining of different uh, layers, time periods, territories, and uh, to uh, uh, to solve this uh, big question, we uh, start working with uh, multi-layer maps, uh, which can be uh, seen by user at the same time. So basically, at our uh, at our at our web platform, user user can compare apple and oranges, so in any uh, type of uh, maps, uh, which uh, is there. User can. Uh, uh, can use and uh, in, in different contexts. For example, here, it's just uh, kind of random selection of uh, three maps. Uh, first is Hungarian Soviet Republic from 1919. Second one is uh, Kingdom of Hungary from interwar period. And uh, uh, third one, bl uh, the blue one is uh, uh, map uh, of claimed Great Hungary from also uh, interwar period, but um, our web page allows to use this map, uh, these maps in different contexts and uh, uh, see how they uh, overlap, uh, 
Uh, and with this overlaps, it's also a uh, great possibility to tell the stories of contested borderlands, contested territories. Um, when we started the project, uh, so our idea was to uh, start with Eastern Europe and to, to uh, provide a tool that can be used, for example, for teacher or for a creator of museum exhibition or for any public historical project uh, when people do need not just a map of, uh, I don't know, Ukraine or uh, Germany from a certain per period of time, but uh, when they need to uh, Mm, software that allow allow you to work with different maps and combine maps from different of different types and from different uh, time periods, and uh, we of course fa uh, faced uh, a few problems in uh, with creating designing this. Uh, uh, idea uh, into uh, web platforms. So, so first of all, uh, it's uh, accuracy of historical maps and uh, geographical uh, information, historical sources, uh, because as many of uh, our listeners know, uh, ge uh, geographical, uh, geographical uh, reference systems uh, were changing over the years and uh, uh, with older historical maps, it's uh, usually a problem to connect them to contemporary one. And uh, uh, if here we have quite a precise map of Austro-Hungarian Empire, which corresponds to many contemporary European borders, it's not a big challenge for us to map it in a digital way. But also we had a lot of uh, maps produced by different uh, nationalist uh, movements, which may look like this one, uh, when you cannot really see uh, um, measures that were used when map basically drawn, and only sometimes some water courses could help to locate these border lines. And even worse situation for <laughs> us in terms of mapping is with uh, textual descriptions, for example, textual descriptions of territorial claim, which is very hard to map. And this, of course, create a, a question about uh, reliability of so these sources and uh, a lot of technical and theoretical questions of how this map uh, could be uh, digitalized. Uh, and uh, next very obvious uh, question is accuracy of digital maps that we are mapping based on these historical maps because um, as uh, for, for the same reasons as i already mentioned digital maps is you, uh, always uh, another uh, it's always different from historical one it's always has own uh, specialities own errors and own limitations and of course we faced uh, uh, many of these uh, problems when we were preparing uh, concrete uh, files uh, to, pu to put on our web page. There are a lot of uh, uh, examples uh, around the uh, internet uh, of uh, people who are trying to put historical map directly on contemporary maps by uh, create, uh, uh, linking them. Here is less accurate examples. There are more accurate, exa accurate examples like here. Uh, it's uh, print screen from uh, Lviv Street's uh, platform at the uh, Center for uh, Urban History. And with this scale, this uh, connection between maps looks more or less accurate, but uh, generally from, for example, for European maps, it's very hard to um, build this connection. So that's why we decided to draw our map. Uh, it's uh, basically uh, all of maps that you can see on our web page. It's uh, manually created uh, as uh, GeoJSON files, of course, general maps of Europe uh, were exported from uh, uh, already uh, existing uh, databases, uh, but still many of them need our uh, cor uh, corrections uh, before uh, placing them online. But uh, if we are speaking about concrete maps of concrete historical periods and countries, uh, most of them were uh, prepared manually and uh, as I said if if uh, original map original source is accurate and uh, uh, has 
system of coordinate uh, on on its base in its base it's uh, a bit easier but if we are mapping something like uh, this propagandistic map uh, of course uh, our digital map is also not looking very accurate and does not look like a uh, let's say real map it looks like something drawn like right and uh, in this case probably uh, it's not avoidable, but uh, still, it's important that we are our uh, and our users uh, are aware uh, of these uh, limitations. Uh, so, and the last uh, issue that I would like to mention is uh, shifting nature of the borders. While mapping any uh, change of territory, uh, we are very selective, uh, and uh, in. Uh, uh, which historical process we are uh, mapping and which we are, let's say, skipping and showing on some other uh, uh, next uh, period map. And of course, it's always our personal uh, choice as researchers. And uh, sometimes uh, it might be questionable, but still um, it's hard to decide which changes of the border should be mapped and which can be uh, skipped in some way. And this is the reason why our maps uh, do not uh, have yet uh, any uh, front lines and uh, do not have a lot of examples of occupied territories because during the war, as you know, border can, can be changing every day or, uh, or even every few hours. So, and uh, our idea was to rather show the uh, tendency uh, uh, in a long and distance then uh, uh, focus on this uh, small uh, on these small uh, details. So we of course faced a, a number of challenges. I will just signalize to several the most important of them. Uh, the uh, first is research expertise. It's obvious that people that are mapping the borders are not experts in all the regions and all and all the uh, countries that we are working with, and of course, it brings some limitations. And uh, um, for many maps, we uh, need to conduct quite. Uh, uh, serious research to dr drones there, and we of course can face uh, um, some controversies of national historical narratives because, uh, for example, we have uh, categories of uh, uh, wartime maps which mostly are created for self-proclaimed or uh, temporary existing states and uh, there you can find uh, states like uh, uh, self-proclaimed states as uh, Donetsk uh, People Republic or Resp Republika Serbska, but also there you can find Ukraine uh, uh, People's uh, Ukrainian People's Republic, which of course might be offensive to Ukrainian national historiography, but still um, from the historical logic, uh, it's war wartime state, which was not uh, fully recognized. Uh, as I already mentioned, precision and accuracy of drone uh, drone borders, which is which uh, still remains a problem for us, and all the time we are spotting uh, mistakes in many maps and trying to fix them. And I think as far as we go. Uh, to a broader audience, we will receive quite uh, sufficient feedback on small uh, mistakes that uh, our map uh, still may uh, contain. Uh, the another bigger uh, theoretical uh, challenge is how to build historical narrative with map or with any other digital content, and. Um, uh, with uh, uh, in our case, uh, we add. Uh, so far, only uh, short textual descriptions to the map uh, that user uh, with this description user can understand why uh, we placed the map of particular year in the particular profile. But still, the description do not explain the mechanism of the border changes and uh, uh, do not explain uh, the. Um, uh, all political contexts that uh, uh, are beyond these uh, uh, changes. Uh, here you can see territorial claims or for or for countries and. Uh, uh, as, as you understand, uh, for example, if we use this map in uh, uh, 
uh, high for high school historical lesson in these four countries, this map would be interpret interpreted in different ways. And uh, we, of course, cannot provide description or right answer or right interpretation for all map combinations. So here, uh, it's also a challenge how to make it on, on one hand open to the user, but at the same time uh, to uh, make this uh, platform uh, uh, as following some historical uh, logic and narrative. And of course, as most, as most of digital uh, historical uh, platforms, we uh, have uh, challenges of accessibility and user friendliness. Now we are mostly testing platform on our, uh, on our colleagues and receiving very different feedback from a uh, very good one to uh, comments that it's still hard to navigate and understand what is going on on our platform. So uh, that's why we would be grateful if you uh, could have time after our presentation and just browse it and send us your feedback. And of course, we start at audience, which I already mentioned. It's uh, still next step to us how to bring this platform to museums, high school, university, or, uh, classes uh, to allow people to use it uh, for their own uh, purposes uh, and um, uh, just to uh, like, like a, as a bridge to a uh, second uh, part of our presentation by my colleague Olena, I would like to uh, one more time signalize that uh, for our own uh, research logic and for uh, friendliness to user, we tried to categorize our maps and it was very long process of changing different categories. And uh, as for now, we stopped with three categories, which is real maps, imaginary maps and wartime maps. And uh, Olena is going to show you how exactly you could explore these three categories of maps and uh, compare, contrast them, and which features we offer to work with these layers. Hello, can you can you hear me? Yeah, uh, sir, I, I, will, uh, I will now share the screen. Um, thank you, Alexei, for um, uh, providing such a detailed background to, what, uh, to, to this kind of practical example that I want to show now. Um, so um, kind of how, how it works uh, on the website. So we have here on the top, we have different years where, where a user can, can browse uh, the changes of European borders uh, through uh, centuries and, and decades. And here we start as 20, uh, 2021, our current map as, as, as the first kind of the initial uh, map, but then uh, the user can browse changes of the border. Um, here we start uh, kind of every 30, 30 years. And then there are just some uh, years that um, we basically picked, uh, but also those that the databases for which were available or on um, online. So this, um, Alexei already mentioned that a lot of those maps were created by us, but those uh, general uh, maps of Europe, uh, we basically we, we borrowed them, but we acknowledged the, the original source of these maps. Um, so yes, as you can see, uh, you can basically browse here the changes of, of the European borders. Uh, through uh, centuries. Um, let me now show a concrete example of, uh, of one particular country, for instance, Poland. Uh, so each of those countries are separate units at, and the user can choose which country they want to browse or which country they want to start with. So if we choose, for instance, Poland, uh, the user will enter this local history mode or how, how we call it, and here, um, it's it's uh, on the uh, on the left hand side. Uh, this is the indication of how many layers for each country we have. So uh, we start automatically from uh, kind of related real territories, as we call them. These are the actual territories of Poland recognized by the international community. And here, as you can see, uh, there is this is the list of those um, kind of. State, form, a form of statehood starting from 1650 to uh, 2021. And the user can browse either by picking any country and any form uh, from the list. And there will be also, as Alexei already mentioned, there will be a short text here describing 
um, this uh, particular uh, government or this particular border, or the user can simply go chronologically uh, from uh, kind of from the earlier form to the later form uh, and kind of see the part of which bigger entity this uh, Republic of Poland was at this uh, or that time. Uh, then we have, uh, for Poland, we have 11 different layers or 11 different projects, uh, intellectual projects of, of Poland. And this is the same principle. The user can either go chronologically uh, and see also in which category this uh, layer appears or pick uh, on the list which, which project they want to, uh, to see. So each project, again, has a very short description, uh, which of course is not comprehensive, but um, allows user um, to see some basic information and then perhaps um, start searching for more. In the future, we want to create some um, kind of cross-references, which would allow uh, users to kind of uh, perhaps, uh, which would kind of send them to either text written by us or to some external sources, where they can find find out more about the project of the, uh, the course online, for instance, or the project of um, uh, third Europe, and so on. The third category is uh, wartime territories, but this is like an umbrella category for different political entities that Alexi already mentioned that includes uh, a different quasi-states, self-proclaimed governments, short-term uh, wartime territories, and so on. So here for Poland, for instance, we uh, for now we have only uh, four of them, and uh, we try to show the part of which bigger political entity this particular short-term uh, republic uh, or short-term government was. So as in the case of uh, Western Ukraine, for instance, you can see that the territory claimed by the uh, government of the Western uh, Ukrainian People's Republic was also a part of, uh, of the kind of territory claimed by different governments at the time. And this is what our uh, platform allows to, to show not only the, the, the borders of the kind of actual borders or claimed borders, but also its relations to other states that were in place at the time. Uh, also, what is Alexi also mentioned that our uh, our map or our tool allows uh, users to compare all different forms of statehood, not only chronologically but also achronologically. Um, Alexi has had already a similar map, but I wanted to show um, a map where where users can by pinning different categories, but uh, but pinning different layers, they can uh, see the overlapping claims of different government on the same territory. These four maps, this is kind of a chronological comparison. These four maps represent the claims of of these respective governments to the Paris Peace Conference of what territory uh, they kind of wanted to. Um, get uh, as a result of the um, of the, this this new uh, territorial uh, arrangement in uh, post world war 1 europe so you can see that obviously we have greater poland uh, like kind of the the, the Dmowski project for poland we have a project of uh, ukrainian people's republic of belarusian people's republic and the uh, the claims that uh, of the of the lithuanian uh, republic but at the same time, um, if uh, users want to um, compare those uh, achronologically, for instance, we can pick any territory by starting, let's say, Albania, and then, uh, for instance, uh, we have Albania in a, the project. Also, this is the imaginary project of Albania in 1978, and they can see how they basically, although there is obviously no territorial connection, but it's allowed, it has this freedom that allows the user to compare uncomparable, as Alexi says, said, apples to, to pears. And uh, users can add as many layers as possible, not only imaginary, but also wartime, also real uh, borders. Um, let's add, for instance, Ukraine in 1939. So we have Soviet Ukraine, which also there is obviously a kind of a problem of overlapping kind of inaccuracies of the borders. But Alexi already explained the problem with that. And um, just to say that those imaginary projects, obviously, they don't always correspond to the kind of actual borders that were in place at the time. So even if there is like this sort of an overlap, it's not necessarily our inaccuracy, but this is the, the map that we based 
our project on. So there is kind of yeah, there is there are inaccuracies, but but it's it's kind of unavoidable. Uh, we found it very difficult to um, kind of provide clear match for all the uh, maps. So yeah, the, the 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 users can search also generally here for any projects uh, they wish. They can pin and unpin those projects uh, and basically play with with the maps that are there and also go back to start and here on the start um, it's it's kind of the user already see can see how many uh, layers there are but these layers only correspond to the uh, those those maps that correspond to like for instance 1990, uh, 1990. but then while by entering into this local history mode, each country has many more layers to play with and discover. Uh, Oleksii, if, if there's anything you wish to add to this, uh, please do or mention what I shall add if I have forgotten anything. Yeah, Oleksii said that we have a tutorial which can be entered via information. And there is a tutorial because it's not always clear um, how to navigate the map. Uh, the, the, the platform. So we have this uh, very brief tutorial explaining uh, possible steps and combinations. Um, yeah, so this is, this is what we have for now, but we will definitely improve based on the feedback we receive when we uh, kind of show this platform and people start using it. Yeah, I just uh, I think we are run, already running out of time, but uh, uh, just to uh, continue Olena's idea that it's still uh, improving web page. So we uh, thanks to project that, uh, projects that were uh, presented today. We. Uh, can uh, can also learn a lot from them because we are actually now thinking how these uh, bo border maps can be uh, accomplished with some kind of uh, bigger storytelling or how we can uh, add uh, m uh, m more information or more uh, research stuff to these maps. So uh, thanks to all the other presentations today, we we can uh, think about different possibilities yeah, and we will be grateful for your feedback thank you thank you Alexi. thank you elena uh, so now we are uh, uh, moving into the uh, session for questions and uh, comments and discussion in general we have uh, learned about the project uh, programming historian which helps uh, a lot in uh, learning and improving digital skills in the historical research. We also learned about the process of developing digital uh, digital resource for teaching, uh, what parts of it, uh, how, to, how to design it, how to go through the process of creating a substantial resource. And we also learned about the mapping platform and the challenges of uh, mapping political borders, but also uh, quite impressive and, uh, and promising opportunities of using such data and tools in historical research. So now we are uh, um, in a moment where we can ask our questions, if there are such, uh, so uh, um, we can leave our questions in the chat or simply raise our hands uh, just to uh, ask question aloud. And I can see some comment uh, with the links. Yes, of course, uh, it is important to say that all the links that uh, were uh, somehow share during the presentations and in the chat room, we will also share, we will archive the chat and we will uh, extract the links from there to, to share them with the participants and the speakers. Uh, if there is a question from the audience, this is the moment to ask. If I cannot see, I cannot see any question yet from the audience, so maybe I will start from uh, mine questions and I uh, probably I will raise those questions in order as the presentations went on. So the programming historian as the pedagogical tool was uh, very interesting for me to learn about that project and to uh, well, actually quite handful to learn also about specific uh, digital uh, tools uh, that could be used for the uh, uh, historical research and visualization of historical data. 
Uh, and uh, I was uh, wondering about the uh, languages that you mentioned, uh, because uh, during the presentation and on your website, it is possible to find uh, uh, language versions, uh, different language versions of this project and learning materials in several languages. And those languages are quite widespread, I would say. So I was curious uh, whether um, you, did you have any experience of uh, collaborating with someone uh, uh, or with some projects or initiatives where uh, languages were, were used less uh, widespread languages, some local languages not as popular as, uh, let's say, English, French or Spanish? And I don't know, maybe let's say Ukrainian, if you're uh, talking in this context, whether uh, there are such experiences of uh, those smaller languages to use in this uh, project or to cooperate with someone. And also I was curious how, um, uh, because you also mentioned that it is possible to contribute to the project and to make translations of several of uh, materials that are published there. So uh, maybe you can also elaborate a bit more about that if one would be interested to contribute. And my third question to this project was uh, uh, related to the very title, because Programming Historian for me um, uh, it was very catchy and I was, uh, the first moment when I uh, learned about this website, I was interested to read it and to learn more about that. Uh, but I was also curious whether uh, uh, what the experiences of working on the resource called Programming Historian helped the team of, the, of these projects to learn more about history of programming itself. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, whether uh, the process of learning how the standards, how the tools shaped, how they are created, what are the origins of these tools and standards and methods uh, uh, in digital history, uh, how they are shaped and how uh, it also shapes our knowledge of uh, um, about past and how we can, based on that, build the critical reflection on the um, digital tools and digital technology in the historical research. Uh, so these are uh, some questions and comments to, uh, to the programming historian uh, tool to Nabil and Jessica. And uh, I also have uh, some questions uh, to Lean uh, about the project uh, on teaching Holocaust history in Ukraine, uh, which is also very interesting and um, very impressive uh, project and the process of making it very substantial as well. Uh, so I was also curious to learn more what are the origins of this initiative in general? So where it comes from, uh, how this initiative emerged to create the resource about uh, teaching uh, the history of the Holocaust specifically in Ukraine? Do you have uh, uh, similar resources or plans for similar resources in other countries, regions? Uh, so how this uh, was uh, originated and created? I was also curious whether uh, the resource is built uh, and is planned to be built on uh, 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 on the USHMM materials and collections only, or you are also thinking about uh, uh, expanding uh, the um, the resource itself with the materials from the uh, other institutions, specifically here in Ukraine, local archives, libraries, or museums. Could it be, uh, would be possible for them to contribute to this resource as well? Uh, and I'm also interested in the long term perspective of this platform, uh, whether it's something that is published and could be used uh, by anyone uh, in the future, or there is also a team behind it that will be maintaining it all, all along the way and uh, will be communicating with potential audiences with some kind of activities or responding to requests and questions and so on. So this long-term perspective, how would you see that? And uh, for the um, Shadows M Empires project, I also have uh, uh, some questions that relate to um, the mapping itself. As you mentioned, it is quite challenging uh, to uh, to map political borders in an accurate way and to, uh, to do that uh, in a way that uh, mm, reflects the divisions of these borders or the actual state of these borders. 
uh, but I was also curious whether you were thinking, because the first thing that comes to my mind when you, I, when I see this political borders, I was in, I'm, mm, uh, the, fir the first moment I'm interested how it is possible to corroborate those political borders visualizations with, uh, for example, mapping uh, ethnographic or cultural regions uh, or other types of data that uh, could be extrapolated on a map, let's say it's census data or various social political data, historical data, but contemporary uh, one as well. Uh, so I was curious uh, about that, uh, whether you planning to uh, corroborate this political borders data with some additional materials uh, or additional data and how it is, uh, how it looks like from your perspective. Uh, yeah, so these are uh, some questions and comments from my side and uh, Mm, and maybe we can just start in the same order as the questions were asked. Um, I think so. Uh, the programming, the, the, the title, the programming historian um, certainly has made, I think I can speak for myself um, and maybe Nabil can in chime in, um, certainly has made us think about the history of computing um, for among other things, having an understanding of this history is useful for uh, sustainability, um, thinking about what sort of tools get used and why, um, thinking about what we can realistically support, uh, what we can realistically expect will be stable enough to be around, you know, in two, three, four years. Um, as a historically all volunteer project, which is something we're trying to change to pay people for labor. Um, we've had to make some often difficult choices about what we can realistically support because we wanna make sure whatever it is we do well, um, which is one of the reasons why we have made our, um, our resources uh, on a common license so that language groups that may have, you know, several million speakers, but aren't sort of the wide ranging Spanish or Portuguese or French um, can still make their additions in collaboration with us um, when we don't have the manpower, if you'll pardon my language, to support languages that are very deserving, you know, Ukrainian, um, we've talked to Italian teams, we've talked to Germans, um, you know, deserving and they have their own vibrant DH communities, but we just don't have enough people to support every single, you know, every single um, group out there for now. Um, so helping to empower people and, and we will work and support with support for people um, as you saw with the Japanese group. Um, Nabil, do you want to do you want to add it, chime in? Yeah, I would say that uh, it, it kind of exactly kind of building on what you're saying. Uh, a lot of it is just that we don't have enough people to to work on the project. We've been uh, we've had um, certain proposals that have come through um, that uh, basically the question becomes kind of about sustainability. How much can they kind of become a part of our process? Um, we have not even, there's even uh, a lot of difficulty where there is uh, a great deal of people that speak the language. So for example, Hindi um, and our largest audience is Indian at this point. Um, and so uh, we haven't even, we, we've barely been able to develop the manpower for that. So we, we're not even hitting those languages yet. So um, yeah, we, we, we think about new languages all the time, but even in, in very popular languages like Hindi or very well, uh, largely um, widely spoken languages like Hindi, um, we haven't been able to develop the, uh, the, the, the sustainability that we would need in order to include them. Um, but we're always open to, to examining new languages. And if, uh, like Jessica mentioned, we have uh, people that do kind of work on stuff like j the Japanese language on their own. Uh, in terms of the the term programming historian and thinking about uh, the history of programming, I would say that currently the me and about 
two other scholars, uh, Jacqueline Wernemont and uh, Matthew Kirschenbaum, were the only DH people that uh, seemed to show up to the history of computing uh conferences so it's a very diverse uh there's a group of people that work on critical code studies uh the kind of culture around code and stuff like that but as far as people that are interested in going into the archives and looking at you know uh old documents about programming and stuff like that those two communities are very distinct at least in the academic uh, world of, of uh, U.S. universities. Um, I'm actually working on an article or I've been thinking about an article about uh, the, the, the relationship between digital humanities and the history of computing, um, because currently the only article on the history of computing on DH is pretty dismissive of the digital humanities as, as a field. Um, and so I'm working on kind of work uh, doing that. Um, but no, I, I don't think that we really have a lot of stuff on the history of programming in the way that somebody would work on it in terms of, uh, you know, publishing in uh, the history of computing journals or something like that. Yeah, um, I will say that one of the conversations we've had um, vis-a-vis expanding our language capacity is um, in addition to, you know, trying to find money to pay people um, is trying to make the process of onboarding new language and supporting new languages more efficient, more labor efficient and easier. Because um, the current process is that we usually want to see six or seven people um, in a language team, you know, to keep up uh, sustained work. And we want people, we want because of the work required to set up the infrastructure for each language team, uh, like a minimum of one year commitment. Um, and that's on top of the six months or more that it can take to get a language team up and running. Um, so that's sort of one of the, the labor involved is one of the other barriers that we're, we're still navigating around. Um, and we, we hope to make things easier and we hope to we hope to expand. It's just um, we're we're max we're kind of maxed out with four right now, and and we're hoping to make some things change in the next six months to a year to see if we can come up with some new strategies. Thank you. It's still impressive work because four languages is not it's a lot. It's actually a lot, of course. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Lean, probably. It's yours. Yes. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, or answer that third question you had about the long term perspective and then also some of my colleagues are here and um, they can speak more to the origins of the initiative and whatnot. Um, so as far as the long term maintenance of this digital platform, we have made the decision to use this existing platform we have at the museum, the Holocaust Encyclopedia, which is in 18 languages, including Ukrainian. Um, and then build out those Ukrainian resources to be more specifically focused on Ukraine and um, based on the feedback from the professors and students. And so what this gives us that benefit of having a built-in development team and a content team that can respond to questions and whatnot from people and also um, make sure the website stays up and running. So we have, it's about five people on the team that work on all of the languages, but you know they have a big translation workflow and working with the, um, the historian staff and the museum and whatnot. So it's, we decided that it was smart to use that platform and build, build on it, build the more Ukrainian resources within that platform so we could have that long-term um, maintenance. And Suzanne, did you want to talk to the origins of this project? Sure. Hi, I'm, I'm Suzanne Brown Fleming, the Director of International Academic Programs, and I'm managing this, this work on Ukrainian Jewry. We, we planned this initiative because of the importance of what happened to uh, the Jews of Ukraine. And by the middle of 1941, there were about 2.7 million Jews in the territory of what is today the independent state of Ukraine, including the Crimean Peninsula. And during the 
war against the Soviet Union led by the Germans, some 1.5 million of those Jews died at the hands of Germans, Romanians, Hungarians, Ukrainians, and others. And only about 100,000 survived the war. So this is an absolutely critical piece of the Holocaust. And there, another critical piece is the rich culture that Ukrainian Jewry built in Ukraine and tried to sustain afterwards. Now, once we recognized that this was really something that was of, of critical importance to the study of the Holocaust, um, we, we decided to start an initiative about five years ago, five, six years ago, and it's got four key components. And I, I this is just, a wonderful presentation by Lynn on one of a four pronged approach that we're taking. The first approach is gathering archives. We've been working for over a decade uh, in Ukraine, gathering um, copies of key archival material and making it available on uh, at the Chappelle Center at the Holocaust Museum so that scholars can do research on this critical topic uh, with ease and be able to use those archival sources alongside other sources as well. Uh, so that is that is one prong. Another prong is we're working on a major publication on uh, the Holocaust and Ukrainian Jewry uh, with also some aspects of Ukrainian life and culture before and after the war. And this um, publication is going to be primarily for Ukrainian universities. It will appear in both English and Ukrainian but primarily the audience will be Ukrainian university students and professors. We have then this digital resource that, that Lynn has presented that uh, we're really working with uh, Ukrainians to figure out the best way to make this easy and available and navigable for them in the classroom. And finally, we do a lot of on the ground work uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we've partnered with Tara Shevchenko University for over five years now to have an annual summer school for Ukrainian students and professors. Uh, that uh, tradition, if you will, will certainly continue. And in the future, we're hoping to expand to other partnerships uh, south of Ukraine, west of Ukraine, and in central Ukraine. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Lean. I just want to add that as we talk about the digital resource uh, about uh, teaching the history of the Holocaust in Ukraine, the, today is the um, 18th anniversary of the Babin Yar uh, mass uh, killing in Kyiv. Uh, so today there is there are different commemoration events uh, taking place in Ukraine. So in this context, uh, this is very relevant and important topic and project to discuss. And uh, now probably we'll pass uh, to, uh, to Olena and uh, Alexei in order to have their answers to the questions. Uh, uh, thank you, Taras, for your question. And um, yes, indeed, we, we, we kind of, we, uh, once we have started this project, we see a huge potential to expand uh, the project and add more layers and add more categories and so on and so on. But um, there, there are some limitations, of course. And, and, and the first uh, important limitation or consideration is that uh, initially we envisaged it as a public history uh, platform. So from the kind of general public perspective, we uh, thought that you know, these three categories would be uh, perhaps at this stage would be already enough to start browsing and exploring the website. But what we do have in mind is of course to um, as Alexi already mentioned, we see the potential of expanding, of deepening uh, the project or, or kind of this local history mode for each country by uh, storytelling. So for each map, we would like in the future to add this kind of a storytelling option where we would, of course, incorporate this, uh, the statistical data, the census data, demographic data, and so on. But it might not be um, kind of shown as a separate category where people can uh, browse, you know, how the statistical data kind of work um, for different countries and compare it in, in the same way as, as with other layers. Uh, also, uh, we have already um, we have already an agreement to uh, expand and have another category for cultural uh, regions, for instance, because it's, 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 it would be very interesting when we have the whole Europe covered to see how those state borders correspond to kind of historical cultural uh, regions. And this is something that, that we would like to do. This is, this is already on our agenda. 
And also, um, you mentioned, uh, you asked about ethnographic data and uh, some uh, those uh, historical maps that were created based on ethnographic or linguistic data, we have included uh, in the category of imaginary um, kind of borders. We have, for instance, uh, some maps uh, for Belarus of this kind, for Ukraine, for Poland, and so on. And in the textual description, we try our best to explain the origin and what this kind of border or this mapping is based on, and then kind of refer the reader back to uh, Chubinsky, Okarsky, and so on, and their research. But uh, what we would need to do, and this is what I mentioned, we would need to add those hyperlinks to uh, other sources, or ideally we would need to have this storytelling kind of another layer uh, where we would tell users more about each of those maps. But this is a, a huge project and it's only myself and Alexi who are doing this. So this is, this is basically for now is a project and then we will see how to expand and how to add and where to start basically with this more in-depth and detailed um, uh, analysis of, of each country. Yes, thank you. It's actually uh, also a huge amount of work, as you mentioned, uh, pre preparing those uh, political borders manually. Uh, and so this uh, this amount of data that you already generated and mapped uh, on this website is uh, quite impressive. I also have one question from Bogdan Shumilovic, which, uh, which is a question about uh, uh, mm, teaching resource about the history of the Holocaust in Ukraine. So this question is rather to Lean or Suzanne maybe, uh, uh, whether encyclopedia, this encyclopedia uh, will include uh, information about artistic interpretation of the topic of mass violence and the Holocaust and uh, whether you plan to have within this encyclopedia an entry point about Stanislav Lem uh, uh, the writer and uh, science fiction writer coming from Lviv, who also ex uh, uh, had this experience of the uh, uh, surviving Holocaust in Lviv. Uh, and it also reminds me about my question of uh, uh, resources and collections from other, uh, um, other institutions and other uh, uh, libraries, museums, whether your project will be open uh, to, include, to include those uh, resources. Uh, because, for example, in your presentation, you also mentioned about Christina Higer's story and uh, the story of hiding in the sewers of uh, sewer system in Lviv. Uh, for example, uh, we at the center at the moment are involved in the project of uh, uh, 3D scanning uh, of the space of the actual hideout where the Higer and her family uh, were hiding uh, uh, in the sewer system, and it will be also uh, it is a part of another project, but then it will be published and I don't know, maybe. So I'm saying that probably there are a lot of different resources here in Ukraine in uh, our collections and libraries and museums and archives that might be also uh, useful and handful for uh, school and teachers and university teachers using this, uh, this resource. Yeah, I mean, we did hear from students and professors that's that you know having content about artistic you know writers artists um, and their interpretations so that's something that we're considering as one of the topics that we'll explore um, and actually I wanted to ask my colleague Elena to talk more about the collections and the, those collaborations. Thanks. Um, hi, I'm Elena Yeagle. I work at the Holocaust Memorial Museum and I am um, sort of heading up the, the digital resource right now. So at the moment, um, we're trying to prepare for the launch of, of the expanded resources targeting Ukrainian topics for the end of next summer. So at least for that date, we're focusing on museum collections only with the fairly large caveat that a lot of our collections, as Suzanne mentioned, are um, scans of copies from some of the larger archives in Ukraine. Um, so we would have to get copyright permission to use things from those materials, but we do have access to them. Um, we also want to provide um, links whenever we can to different um, 
different projects or museums that we're aware of. So if the Center for the Study of Urban History puts up um, the scan of the sewer where Christina Heger was hiding, you know, we could definitely link to that as far as um, kind of incorporating materials from Ukrainian museums and libraries and other things. That's something that we haven't talked about yet at this point. Um, it's certainly a, a really interesting and exciting idea, but we would have to see what, what develops um, in future phases. If you have any, and I, I'm afraid I hadn't heard of the artist that was mentioned, but I'll type my email address into the chat. And if anyone has you know, resources, resources or links that they think I should know about, um, please send me an email. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. This was actually the purpose of this event as well, uh, like to share contacts and information about projects uh, so that we can also mm, connect with each other afterward after this seminar and learn about uh, our projects uh, in the future. Uh, we are slightly running out of schedule, but we also uh, ending the, uh, the entire event. So as a short closing remark, I just want to thank you all of the speakers and all of the presentations for sharing uh, uh, your projects with us for uh, thank you for your time for your presentations and links that you send to us i also want to thank you uh, the audience that joined that registered and joined our event during uh, in the zoom conference also our audience on youtube uh, thank you for uh, asking questions, for uh, joining the discussion. I'm sure there is a lot of links and projects that we are going to explore after the presentation, and we will definitely uh, archive all the links in the chats, and we will uh, share uh, the recording of this uh, of this seminar online. So I also encourage you to share to share it to the relevant audience, so so that the people that are interested in the projects or topics mentioned in the seminar uh, could uh, learn about that. I also want to thank you, the colleagues for from the um, from the center who made this event possible, who uh, took put a lot of efforts in organizing this event. Uh, thank you again uh, to all of you, and also Center for Governance and Culture, the University of Singapore, for the supporting this event. Uh, and uh, if, uh, unfortunately, we are not all in Lviv at the moment, but those of you who are in Lviv or uh, those of you who are planning to visit Lviv in near future, I strongly encourage you to visit the center and our exhibition at the center. We at the moment are having a great exhibition about amateur filmmaking in the Soviet Union, this phenomenon of uh, amateur cameras and amateur movies uh, called Society with the Camera. We uh, very much like this project ourselves and we encourage you to visit if you have uh, such a chance. Uh, and of course, I encourage you to follow our activities uh, of the center in the uh, in the field of digital history, but also other our projects on our website and uh, social media, uh, because uh, the event that we did today is not the last one. We, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is a series a series of uh, events that we organize called digital history seminars. So we plan another one this year, and there are definitely will be more next. Uh, next year so uh i hope you enjoyed this discussion i hope you've learned something interesting in you and in you uh, myself i was uh, for me it was very inspirational and i hope it is the same for you so uh without further ado i just want to thank you again and uh have a nice uh, day have a nice evening have a nice uh time in general thank you Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.